My uh, condolences to the families of the victims um, out in Idaho uh, for their loss. It's my sincere hope that uh, this marks a clear step in the right direction of effectuating justice for those folks. Um, my office's role was uh, relatively recent. Uh, we weren't um, advised of the presence uh, of the defendant in our county until um, only a couple days uh, before the apprehension of the defendant. Uh, but when we were told, uh, we came together and worked very closely um, with uh, Captain uh, Kramer, who did an excellent job in uh, almost like a clockwork operation. Uh, part of uh, my duties um, were to ensure that three separate search warrants uh, were issued. Uh, those affidavits attached to those search warrants are still under seal, so I can't. Good evening, everybody. Hey, guys, and welcome to Sunday's Live. Welcome in. Welcome on in. So I did a video in the beginning. I wasn't a mess up. <laughs> I meant to do that. I didn't know if you guys would be typing in the chat like, oh, Tanya played a video instead of her intro music. But I wanted to do something a little different. So, um, yeah, that's what I did. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. I thought maybe we could do like trailers before the lives start. Um, but I'm still figuring out how to actually put on a trailer. So I just did it that way, but thank you. Well, thank you, Summer. Thank you. I'm wearing a new outfit today. It's like a two piece outfit. I got it months ago and I never wore it. And I was like, today's the day. Today's the day. So did everyone have a good Sunday? It's been a pretty good day for me. It's been like a slow day, kind of. Um, it's like a it's a weird time to come on because like I'm used to, I've been used to the um, eight fifteen lives. Oh, just trying to put the PCA up there, but I came on a little bit early. So good evening to everybody. Oh, <laughs> Amanda, are you okay? Do we need to come and get you? I think that, did he get that because at one time the last time he drank, <laughs> we were trying to get you to get him. <laughs> we were trying to get you to do something for, with your with um, your husband. I forget what it was. It was something because you had been drinking her. We were taunting you in the chat. He came home with a K-Born knife like 12 inches. That's crazy. Is it heavy? I've heard that they're heavy. Oh, you went swimming today? That's fun. That's a lot of fun. Oh, I love the name. Try the tea. I love that name. Hello. I love that name. That's a good name. That's a good time to go swimming. I went, I was going to go swimming today Um, at our pool. We have a pool like where we live and we live like a building down from it. So it's literally... It's so nice, but, um, I didn't make it over there today and I usually do, but there's a fun, I wish I could have taken a video of this and I should do it and take a bit, like a video with my phone to show you guys. There's a new option on StreamYard now, I guess, to make, um, us feel prettier about ourselves or a little better about ourselves. They put on this option and it's called, um, like touch up option. You know, how like TikTok has a touch up option and it like makes your skin look a little smoother. Oh my Lord, this touch up option. It makes me look like a fake person. 
I was like, oh my gosh. Like before I got on the live, I forgot that I had pressed that button. And I was like, Vincent, why do I look like a fake person? Did you put a filter on me? And he was like, no. <laughs> so it was StreamYard. I thought that that was kind of, that was kind of funny. I was like, I'll tell them about that. They'll think that's funny today. My little elbow is dry, but yeah. I heard that those knives are very heavy though. Snowboarding. Oh no, not me. Mm -mm. I do live near a ski resort though. So let's see here. If you guys don't mind smashing that like button, we'll go ahead and we'll get started with the live. So quiet. Oh, it's because I don't have my fan. I'm like, it's so quiet in here tonight. I'm going to turn it on. Oh, wait, look, I, it wasn't. Hold on a second. <laughs> Hold on one second. This fan's broke. I swear I'm going to have to like retire because that means I just broke everything today. <laughs> I think it's just not plugged in. Huh. Well, I guess I don't have a fan. That's that's a bummer. But that's all right. <laughs> that's so funny. I just bought that fan. Oh, oops. I literally just got this fan. Everything's breaking and I don't know what's going on with my life. So last night, well, yesterday, it's working now, but yesterday my watch when it keeps going off, it just turns off. And I do like a hard reset won't come on. If I put it on the charger, it'll like kind of, it'll turn on and then it just turns off after a while. So I think I need a new watch. My phone last night when I went over to Brian's live to go on panel, um, I went on his live and my phone wouldn't turn back on. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God. It's a brand new, it's like a, I mean, it's a nice phone. It's a brand new phone. I just got it like last year, I think. And I'm sitting here, I'm freaking out and Brian's like, Oh, it's fine. My phone does that. And I'm like thinking, no, no, my phone doesn't do this. So then, um, and then my monitor, remember my monitor has been acting funky. I just got a new monitor yesterday. So it's so weird. There's like bad juju, bad juju guys, but it's okay. Can't get me down. <laughs> Can't get me down anyway. So, um, on Friday nights live, I forgot to actually put part three on the, um, I think on the thumbnail, but this is like part three of what we've been discussing over the last two days. But if you haven't been over, if you haven't been here over the last two days, you don't need to be here to be caught up with what's going on. I'm full of static. Let me know if it makes it, if it's any better. Am I good? I sound good on mine. Um, I'll keep going and let me know. And if it is, then I don't know what's going on with my stuff. Um, you wasn't home last night? Oh, well, you're here today. Well, so on Friday Night's Live, we just discussed um, Brian's travels, alleged travels. I'm going to say that, alleged um, travels from his apartment in Pullman, Washington to Moscow, Idaho, um, the King Road residence. Oh, she, she meant when I touched devices. <laughs> I was like, Isabel's on my staff. There's my bloopers. Isabel's going to learn how to edit one of these days and she's going to have a full, she's going to have a full channel with Tanya's bloopers because <laughs> I have them a lot. I have them sometimes. Um, so on Friday nights live, it was, you know, Colberger traveling from his house to King road residence. And then last night's live, we went over Brian traveling from, you know, um, the King road residence back to his house. And it was hard to find the visuals, but we got through it. <laughs> we got through it. We did it. So um, I'm going to throw my notes up here. So on tonight's live, we're going to um, do like our final part. And we're going to talk about Brian, um, what he allegedly did on the morning of November the 13th and the evening into the evening of the 13th. So um, don't come for me if I say, if I say the night of the homicides, I guess I say that and I, People are like, well, it's the morning of, but I think of it as they didn't, they were, they went out and they didn't go to bed really. So it's still like, that was that same night to me. So, you know, if that makes sense to you guys, yeah, those would be cute. I used to have bloopers really bad all the time and they were really funny. They were really funny. Isabel was like, we're just going to make a blooper thing for you. And I'm like, that's a good idea. <laughs> that's a great idea. Maybe some, maybe a clip channel will find me. Um, so where is my notes at? So, um, 
what's that? What am I saying on my notes? Okay. I'm like, what am I even saying on the notes? So tonight, basically what we're going to talk about is, um, Brian Koberger's travels from him going back to the crime scene the next day, and then him taking his trip to Albertson's coffee shop, Albertson's. And then, you know, later on he was seen what we thought was in Johnson, Idaho, but later the, the second PCA came out and it corrected it to Johnson, Washington. So I don't know if you guys remember that, but that was a headache <laughs> when we had to all go through that. Um, we didn't know where Johnson, Idaho was, and it was like a little dot in the middle of nowhere, but we were reading the PCA at the time. So I'm going to put our um, members in here. So if you want to join this, me not having this noise in here is like killing me. It's making me like, feel like I'm not with it. And I'm going to um, also put this back in the chat really quick before I pull up the, I wanted to show you guys some stuff. There we go. Usually I pin this before um, I come on the live and I forgot to pin it. So I'm welcoming you guys in again. Welcome in. Welcome, welcome. Um, if you guys are just joining us, we are getting into it. I'm just over here freaking out about life and not having a fan, you know. That's like nothing. That's like, that's like nothing, you know, pennies to what we talk about on this channel. But it's very quiet in here. And that sometimes is like weird. It's eerie. <laughs> so I wanted to show you actually to start off the live um, a couple of pictures. And um, I also wanted to point out and let you guys know, I want to let everyone know if you have any questions um, at all over this case or any of the cases, you know, that we talk about on the channel. But if you have any questions over this case um, and you just put the, um, put the cue in the um, chat and then write out your question and I'll pin it if I can't get to it right away. And then I'll get to it at the end of the chat. That way, nobody um, has any questions, really, because I feel like. There's a lot of uh, BS flying around out there and we're getting away from a lot of the facts of the case. And so I've been trying over the last few days to kind of pull it back to the facts of the case and the PCA. And um, so if you guys have any questions, don't be afraid to ask them. Even if you think they're silly, they're probably not. We probably have the same questions, you know? So I just wanted to let you know. Hey, Super Greek. His car has a GPS and it. it's why Ann Taylor requested an ex parte hearing with the prosecution. But um, his car doesn't have a GPS, super Greek. His phone isn't equipped with a GPS. They would have to do like teletomatics or something. Um, you can tell when you look inside of his car, it's not equipped with the navigation for that, that year. Um, and his dad's also has the cell phone on his lap and it has the maps open to it. Like you could see it, um, like, you know, when you open your Google maps or maps on your iPhone, you can see it on his leg. Um, so I don't think that's why, um, because they have, his, they have him on the, like they have him on camera. They are like traveling to there and then away from there. And then today we're going to talk about traveling back to there, but yeah. Um, but before we do all of that stuff, I wanted to show you a cute picture, something cute to start the live off with. Um, okay, so here is Miss. Let me put Miss Christy up here. So this is this is Kaylee's mom, of course, Christy. She's in a tattoo parlor, and I don't know if this right here, like underneath of her, is like a dog bed or if it is a car seat. I can't see, so that might be Maddie Mae down there, or it could just be, or it could be Murphy or a puppy. I don't know, like the little. Um, where the, the little yellow heart or yellow flowers are. I don't know if you guys um, got to see these. She went to go get a tattoo. Yeah, it's, I think it's, I think it's just like his car didn't like, there's certain models of his car that came with, um, that came with the navigation. And then there were some models that didn't come with navigation and he got like the lower end um, of the car. But I think that they do definitely have some sort of teletomatics in the car to show like tracking or something. I just don't know. I guess the defense would have to get their own like expert if they wanted to, you know, counter the prosecution's um, cast or whatever, you know, or no, not cast, I'm sorry, but their expert that they'll have, they would probably just do that. I would say, you know, that's what I would do. I mean, if I was, 
her. I, I, I mean, if he, if, if she believes that he didn't, you know, commit these homicides and he's like, Hey, check the car, then yeah, go check the car. But he was driving for a long time that night. I mean, she says it herself, November 12th through November 13th. And he's on camera, you know, at 2.44 a.m. to 5.27. But she's saying he was driving way before that, like before midnight on the 12th. So it's very strange. It's just very, very, very strange. I can't wait for this um, to go to trial. I hope that it just, I hope it goes in October. I mean, everyone seems like they're ready, but you know what's going to happen. And it'll be like a couple of days before and they'll be like, we're not ready. We're not ready. And be like, what? Just like kind of like the preliminary. I forget how long I forget how long we were for the preliminary. Uh, from the preliminary when they did the grand jury. I can't remember. Um, but I wanted to show you her tattoo she got. She got one for um Kaylee and for Maddie. So I thought it was really pretty. I think it might be like maybe their favorite flowers. I don't know. Maybe one on one side, one on the other, but oh, I thought that was um a good picture. Probably healing for her too, you know? Because like, I, I love tattoos. Oh yeah, her little sweater. Wasn't that cute? I know. Can you believe we're going to be coming up on a year? Because it's crazy. Like the, the season's coming back. Like, it's just really crazy to me. Hey, Brie. Hello, Huey. Oh, I, I'm missing some people. Hi, everybody coming on in. Brella extracts info from car computer. Thank you. I'm going to look that up. Because I looked into it. Um, I was in a really bad car accident in 2014. And I was in a 2011 Honda Civic. And it had a black box in it. Um, but they didn't even pull the black box. I don't I don't know why. But they did it. But I, I remember I looked into all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, back then it's just been 10 years since I've really looked into it. So, so I just wanted to show you that to begin the live. I thought those were cute little pictures there. Um, of her getting a tattoo. And like I said, it's probably very like therapeutic for her to do that. I've always wanted to get a tattoo done, um, for my parents, but I just never, I've never done it. Do you put this up here? I can draw down like all my papers. And let's see, where do I want to start? Okay, so I wanted to start, um, basically, tonight's live, we're going to start over the PCA. Um, just like we went, on, you know, we did over the last two lives, we started with the PCA um, to track Brian's movements, allegedly. And um, I want to know what you guys think, what he could have been doing um, during this time, like, each time. I mean, he, he goes a few different places on this route. So I want to know what you guys think he's up to. So we'll go to the PCA. And then I brought up my timeline that I made back in January. I think it was January. Yeah. Right after the PCA came out. So I brought, um, I have that up too, that we can look at. And basically I'm just going to read a few pages of the PCA. Um, everything that's in pink is going to be Brian roaming around the next day. Basically everything that's in green was from, um, last night. Oh, and then I saw another question on here. Sorry, I actually pinned it though, but I remembered. Um, weird because Big Al said BK's car, no black box. He worked in that field. Maybe, yeah. And he might not have a black box in his car. I just know the car I was in had one. And it was a 2011. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying that his car does. I'm just saying the one I was in did. It was a 2011 um, Honda Civic. And they started putting them in that car that I was in in 2011. You can actually look it up by their VIN number. Um, you can look up if there's like a recall or if there's something like that. So I, yeah, I would look it up. Good evening. Welcome on in Moto. Um, let's see. So I'm going to read over the PCA here. <laughs> Every time I say that now, it makes me giggle. I'm going to get a shirt that says, let me see. Cause I do say that a lot. Um, and then the eight, four, five, eight phone is going to be Kohlberger. So just so you know, um, it says further review indicated. I want to make sure I start on that page. Yeah. That phone, um, that the 8458 phone utilized cellular resources on November 13th, 2022, that are consistent with the phone leaving the area of the Kohlberger residence at approximately 9 a.m. and traveling to Moscow, Idaho. 
Specifically, the 8458 phone utilizes cellular resources that would provide coverage to the King Road residents between 9.12 a.m. and 9.21 a.m. The 8458 phone next utilizes cellular resources that are consistent with the 8458 phone traveling back to the area of the Coburger residence and arriving to the area at approximately 9.32. So he's aware on how to get back home from King Road to his house, the straight way, you know, the 10 minute route that people would take. But he took, you know, last night we went through it and we were even on that back road. He took like the longest possible route home, went to Genesee almost, cut across and then went up to Pullman. So do you guys think when he supposedly went back to the crime scene that night or that morning, I'm sorry, that morning, do you think that he was going by to see what happened? Like, Maybe he was like, oh, like he wanted to see the carnage, you know, like the ambulances, the police, the, the, you know, the chaos. Or do you think that maybe he went back to collect his sheaf? Or do you think maybe he's just driving up? He's just driving around. That's what he's doing. That's his, that's his, you know, alibi. He's just driving around. And then let me check out that one. I, 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 call, I started yours, Therese, statement. I'm totally into um, Idaho 4, so I listened to other creators earlier. Oh, and TV. Oh, I thought they, oh, thank you. TV and LTL are the best. Didn't realize a stop BK made in Pullman was in the facility of the um, Brickle Apartments. Yeah. Oh, I, I saw the like the Q part. I was like, oh, got to pin that one. So um, I'm trying to see if I can get them all. But yeah, if you guys have any questions, just put the Q in your question. If I don't see it, say it to Anya. I'm over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he could have done that. Yeah, he could have drove driven across state line. That's why we're going to see exactly like kind of how he was traveling that night. Because I want to, you know, I mean, I want to see what he was doing. Now, I don't know why he would go to back to the um, to the crime scene. I I don't know him if I don't know. I don't know if he went back there, or or he could have went back. This is another possibility. I mean, this is heaven forbid. What if he was like, I left a witness. I got to go back, or you know. You think he went back for the sheaf, Isabel said, or Nina said, sorry. Nina said, I think he went back for the sheaf to see if he dropped it. I'm thinking that too, kind of. I think that he, um, I don't know though. You would think by 9, 12 a.m. that you would, if you pulled up and you just see a, a house, it's so quiet. I don't, you know? Now, wouldn't that be a thing if like they didn't know who if 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 well if this was true, this isn't true. But if we didn't know who hadn't placed the 911 call, like if we didn't know that it was from you know a roommate's phone, if we didn't know that part, I would almost be like, did Brian call the cops on himself? <laughs> because you know, you pull up, you think you if he did this, he just like off four people and then he pulls up to the house and nothing's going on. And he's just like, um, Let's go, you know, like he's probably thinking like, what the hell? Huh? I would be personally. He was totally into the carnage you think, um, doodle bug. That's why cops take pics of crowds at crime scenes. Yep. You're, you're exactly right. They do. And at funerals, they'll go to funerals, you know, but just so they can see what's, how the crowd is acting, how they're responding and stuff. That's just what they do. But you know, that's a, that's a good thing that they do that. And the next page I wanted to read, and that's, I mean, that's a good conversation piece. Like, what do we think he was doing? Because, I mean, I don't know if I'd ever, I don't know if I'd go back there. But then again, I feel like he felt safe in his car. You know, like, I mean, like some people are like this. I'm like this. I'm, I'm the same way. Um, you're like kind of in your car and you feel like, you know, that's like your safety spot. Like no one can kind of like get to you. Like I'll be in there singing, dancing. People will be looking at me like, what's this girl doing? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, y'all can see me, you know, those kind of things. Oh, thank you, Jan, for gifting memberships. Oh, she gifted five memberships. Welcome. Oh, Kathy and Michelle and Bree and Bree and Marianne. Look at that cheap race. I bet it freaked him out. No cops were there. I think it would too. It would freak me out if I did that. Like if I did that to somebody, I would be, I would be freaked out. I can't even imagine. And these little, these little maps are so sad. 
I can't wait for the trial to see the actual map that will, you know, um, that they'll have. So here um, it says, further analysis of the cellular data provided showed the, show the 8458 phone utilized cellular resources on November 13th, 2022, consistent with the phone traveling from Pullman, Washington to Lewiston, Idaho via U.S. Highway 195. At approximately 1236 p.m., the 8458 phone utilizes cellular resources that would provide coverage to the Kate's Cup of Joe coffee stand. Located at 810 Port Drive, Clarkston, Washington. Surveillance footage from the U.S. Chef's store located at 820 Port Drive, Clarkston, and adjacent to the Kate's Cup of Joe showed a white Elantra consistent with suspect vehicle one drive past Kate's Cup of Joe at a time consistent with the cellular data from the 8548 phone. And I was going to um, look that up for us um and i forgot to do that i have to find the okay 810 my maps is going to think that i live like out west is this really what it is okay now i can see it So here's Port, and then um, what was the other road that he they were saying? Um, they were the same road eight eight ten and then eight twenty. So the UF Chef store. I'm trying to see if I can see it on the map, but I don't see it on the map. probably back in this parking lot like one of these like maybe one of those buildings but that or maybe even in this building beside it let's see if i put an 820 oh it's literally like right yeah so it's the building that yeah this one here and then kate's cup of joe's here so they got him going down port road cruising for that coffee now so from step toe to port 820 port or like right beside kate's cup of joe is um 47 to 52 minutes from his apartment now i don't know anybody that has a, a cup of coffee that good <laughs> Hey there, Virginia. Hey, Lisa. Oh, thank you. I don't know. De Detective John's been over here a little bit. I think he's getting his channel started. I think I heard that. So he should be going live soon. Hey, laughing stock. Hey, everybody coming in. Hey, Danielle. Hey, guys. Hey, Cats Life. Hey, Cats Life. I haven't seen you. It feels like. <laughs> it's like I haven't seen you a couple of days. Hey, seen Jenny. Oh, not miss. You haven't missed too much. You haven't missed too much. We're just going through the PCA and we're retracing Brian's steps the day, um, his alleged steps, you know, the day of the homicides or the morning of, and then the evening but leading up into the evening. Where was the map? Okay. So we'll go back over to the, um, the PCA. But so he went to the Cape's Cup of Joe. And then um, at approximately 1246, the phone then utilized cellular data in the area of the Albertsons grocery store at 400 Bridge Street in Clarkston, Washington. It's like one of the main roads where I live. used to like, yeah, so let's do. Let's do a 10 port drive and then we'll do um, the Albertsons address if I can find it. 400 Park Street. Clark. 
Clarkson, right? Okay, just want to make sure I get that correct. Um, and then I'll put it back over. I thought you guys were on the same page as me. So, so the the um, Kate's cup of Joe's like over here. So he would have had to come out, you know, and then come down. So he could have just looked up, you know, if he was at the Kate's cup of Joe, he could have just looked up. Um, maybe let's say, I don't know what he was doing at Albertsons, but let's say he was buying um, flowers. Maybe he looked up, you know, floral shops near me and Albertsons came up because they sell florals, you know, floral arrangements inside their grocery store. Or let's say he was buying cleaning agents and he didn't want to go to like a dollar store but or a Walmart to where he thought he would be seen on, you know, a bigger system. Maybe he thought in Albertsons, hey, they might not have a, they might not have a system there. Because I don't know what, Al I mean, Albertsons is, I and now I know it's like a big chain, but before I didn't know what it was. So he might not have known what it was. He's from the East Coast. So, hey, Laura. Welcome from Canada. Mm -hmm. Don't underestimate that Washington coffee. I drive eight hours for a shot of espresso from Pike Place. Really? Pike Place Market? Well, then I better not say anything. I'm not a coffee person. I don't, don't let anyone know that. I might have a coffee, coffee promo coming up. I might love coffee. You never know. But no, I'm not, I'm not a big coffee drinker. Um, Vincent is. Yeah. So like I'm, um, I'm from Ohio, so we have Kroger and if I don't see a Kroger, like I won't go in there and grocery shop is so bad, but it's like Kroger's my home, you know, like, I don't know. It's, it's a, it's an, e a, an East coast thing, but you're in Ont Ontario. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, look at that. Hey, crazy grandma. Starbucks coffee is good, but expensive. I used to have, we're going to talk about coffee for a second. I'm going to tell you. I used to love Starbucks mochas. I never drank Starbucks up until four years ago, maybe four years ago. And I drank it for about six months and I loved it. It was like my thing in the morning, my mocha. I loved it. And then one day they switched something up in the drink and I can't drink them now at all. Like, I, And I don't like anything else from Starbucks. So I guess I save a lot of money, not, you know, not going to Starbucks. Jennifer, you are, you're from Ohio. Oh, well, look at that. I'm from the Southwestern. That's where I live. I'm not really from there, but you know, not from there, not from here, but this is where I'm, I live. So we'll go back over to the PCA. What do you guys think that he got at Albertsons? Do you think that he went to Albertsons to go groceries shopping? Because, and we, and we don't know if this is true. And I wish I would have looked this up because it just hit me. I, I don't, I don't remember where um, this came from. I think it came from, a source from the jail. I don't know. But he said like that I, Brian Kohlberger said that the shopping is better in Idaho. Like, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if he said that. I don't think he probably said that because he's a man of few words for real. <laughs> like we haven't heard him say much. So I don't know if he would really be talking to other inmates, but you never know, I guess. This one. Um, so this one shows his possible track. Like you're not going to you're not going to be able to read that one. Um, it says additional analysis of records for the 8458 phone indicated that between approximately 532 and 536 PM, the 8458 phone utilized cellular resources that provided coverage to Johnson, Idaho, which they mean jo Johnson, Washington there. Um, this is the PCA from Pennsylvania. I should have pulled up the second PCA, the second PCA, they corrected it. Um, cause we all thought it was, this little dot out of nowhere, but it really, it's um, Johnson, Washington. The 8458 phone then stops reporting to the network from approximately 5.36 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Okay, let me see. Okay. Um, that is consistent with the 8458 phone being, being the area that the 8458 phone traveled in the hours immediately following the suspected time the homicides occurred. So... He turns his phone off from like 2.44 to like 5.20 something in the morning. And then 
he turns it back off again from 536 to 830 PM. I, I don't, I don't really know, um, any reason to do that. <laughs> like, why would you need to do that, sir? And then they don't know where he, like, we don't really know where he was at after Johnson, um, Washington, which I could pull that up. Let's see. Um, Thirty-four minutes. Like, what is? They used to have this on maps where you could set it up where you could see what kind of attractions. Is it up here? Like, um, remember, because we looked it up before, where we could see like state parks and stuff like that along the way. That would be nice to be able to look up. Lower Grant, Granite Lake. Well, what's this lake that he's passing over? This is a lake. Hmm. Let's go back. This is, yeah. So, yeah, this looks like a lake right here that he would have crossed. Yeah, that's what this is. He crossed this to get to, oh, I'm not even showing you guys. I'm like, oh, hold on a second. Let me show you this. This is what he was crossing. He crossed this road. So, um, like, if you go to the maps, I thought I was showing you this. Sorry, guys. Um, I put in Albertsons and then I just put in Johnson, Washington, because um, that's where he headed. And um, like if you the, the little black mark here, like this is a lake or a reservoir. Um, so this is the street view of it. Huh. I wonder if Albertsons has as many cams as Kroger has. I'm thinking that they might, Mike. I'm thinking that they might have cameras and they were, they might not have, um, you know how when you get a receipt, sometimes at, like the grocery store, they'll categorize like all of their like cleaning agents. They'll put it into like cleaning like department. So they might not have, when they pulled the receipt, they might not have like got, um, like known what he had gotten but they would have if they had cameras, especially those self-checkouts. So Albertsons is like a grocery store. It's like a big chain of grocery stores out West in um, the United States. And they sell like just everything that you could think of, like grocery products, but then they'll have like, um, like a floral department. Sometimes they'll sell like cleaning stuff, um, pet stuff. Uh, sometimes they'll have like a pharmacy, things like that. Like a one-stop shop. Yeah. Grocery store. Hey, legendary is in here. Where? Now we have to start the life all over again. I didn't know about this before. You can stay in here if you want. Yeah, kind of like a Walmart, but smaller. Yeah, they kind of have like a little bit of everything, but yeah, I would be shocked if they didn't have cameras also. And I'm thinking like when I go to Target, I don't know if you guys notice, you'll notice next time you self-checkout, but when you self-checkout, I swear, they're like right here in your face. Like, I'm like, I'm going to scan it. I'm going to scan it. Don't worry. I won't forget nothing. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I wonder if the, this isn't like a flowing like lake or whatever this is. It doesn't look like. Like to me, it doesn't look like it's, I don't know. I mean, you, it would, they need to, they need to throw some divers in there, I guess. Yeah. I, I didn't know that before. Oh, they do own Safeway? That makes sense. I love Target, Cheryl. It's my thing. It's my jam. You know it is, though. I'm going to drink. I love Target. So bad. Oh, you're welcome, Gigi. Thanks for being here. 
I appreciate it. You have to smile before your card works, Mike said. <laughs> that would be funny. Because <laughs> like it really it does feel like that. So what's what else is in the plaza? Um, which one? The one when he was at by Albertsons and stuff? I can look. Here we go. Um back. I don't know if it, oh wait, let's see if we can look at, yeah, let's see if we can look at maybe Albertsons. Where are you at, Albertsons? There it is. Oh, nope, I wanted to be, I'm not good at like dropping myself down. I don't really know how to do that. <laughs> so I'm going to see if we can get us down there somehow. Trying to do like street view. Also, there's nothing else in that. Um, there's a convenience store over here. But um, yeah, I don't know. There's building over here. And he could have went to this little Java shop, but he didn't. Huh. It's very just out of the way, you know, it's just very, it's very out of the way. Um, that's just different to me. I, you know, I don't know if I would be cruising around, but I mean, I guess if I, if I committed a, you know, a horrible crime, I probably wouldn't be able to sleep. So I guess I would probably be driving around, probably trying to um, get rid of things, clean up things. I don't know why his phone would stop at 536 to 830. You know, um, most people have a phone charger in their car. So I don't think that the phone would go dead. I think that he either turned it off or he put it into like airplane mode. Which if it's. I have a question. I don't know if I've ever asked this before. I don't know if I know this answer. If it's in airplane mode, can they, tr can you still track, get your movements tracked? Because it seems like you would still be able to track your movements in airplane mode. But maybe if you, um, I mean, if you un, like, if you turn the alerts off, but let me know if you know that, that uh, the question, that answer, because I forget. I forget. And good evening to everybody coming in. Thank you guys all for being here. I appreciate it so much. So, so much. There's Miss Behaven. Look at her. <laughs> if you guys wouldn't mind just taking a second to hit that like button, it really helps the channel. It's free to do too. It's free. It's free. So what page are we on? Oh, we were on the last one. That, that was the last one for that one. So that one was pretty quick um, compared to the other two, you know, him going back and forth. Bill, you've been a member for six months. Look at, you got your rainbow arm. Oh, look at that. I love that. I love these rainbow arms. I'm loving this. I really am. We, we've been doing this for a minute then. Vincent said today he's going to have to make some um, new emoji like arms. And I told him to get on the emojis for us too. We need some new emojis because we have, if you, it depends on how many members you have. If you, the more members you have, the more emojis you get. It's a good selling technique too. You know, like, hey, you guys got to be a member if you want the more emojis, but that's how they do it. That's just how they do it. So um, I'm going to show you this next little map that I found. I couldn't find um, any that were like from, you know, him going to Albertsons and stuff of that nature. But I did find the, this one from him going to um, his house in Pullman to the King Road residence. Oh, and Bill just gifted five memberships. Thank you so much. Bill, that's so nice. Thank you. JD and Dan and Laura and Selena and Cheryl got one. Look at that. Can't beat that. I love free memberships. They're the best. <laughs> I get them. Like sometimes I'll be in another chat and I'll get them. And I'm like, yes, I love that. One time I was actually going to renew my membership. It was in uh, Crime Lines and Lies' chat. And someone gifted it and it went to me and I was like, I was literally had my, my finger on the button and I was like, oh, that's cool. Huh? That's really cool. 
So this, I got this off of Twitter. Um, I have the full timeline. If you guys um like want me to read that sometime, I can. Or if you guys want me to send it over um, through the chat, I can send it in the chat for you guys to look at. Um, but it does show like, you know, the movements and it just says, it'll, it'll tell you a page of the PCA that they're bringing it from too, which I like. It says page 14 of the PCA, further review indicated, and it's going to be pretty much what I said, just like, you know, a recap, but um, indicated that the 8458 phone utilized cellular resources on November 13th, 2022, that are consistent with the 8458 phone leaving the area of the King Road residence at approximately 9 a.m. and traveling to Moscow, Idaho. So then um, at 20 or number 26, page 14, the phone tech, the phone next utilizes um, cellular resources that are consistent with the 8458 phone traveling back to the area of the King Road residence and uh, arriving to the area at approximately 9.32 a.m. I forgot to put on my glasses. That probably helped. And then in the middle, it says, you know, did um, BK return to the scene of the crime between 9.12 and 9.21? Specifically, the 8458 phone utilized cellular resources that would provide coverage to the King Road residents between 9 a.m. or 9.12 a.m. and 9.21 a.m. Now, how do you think that we need a defense attorney in here? Because how do you that how how is how is Ann gonna do this? Where they where he went to the crime scene, he's seen on all these cameras, heading towards the crime scene, circling around, being in the area of the crime scene. Um, his phone is off network when the crimes happen, but shortly after the crimes happen, a car matching his description seen fleeing the scene and his phone turns back on. But not only that, but then he wakes up the next morning at 9 a.m. and he goes back over to that same spot because I guess driving around there for hours on end the night before was just that much fun. I want to go do it again. Like, how is, how is and going to conquer this one. I have no, I I'm, I'm at a loss for words. When this alibi came out, I'm just trying to piece it like in here somehow and make it make sense. And I can't like make it make sense. Um, Moto said, if he didn't want to be caught, why not take the SIM card out? Um, yeah. Out of the, out of the Wi-Fi, then commit crime and then turn it back on to create an alibi. If his car was caught on camera at the crime scene. Yeah, that's true. He would, he wanted to do cyber crimes. You would think. I think what he did was he took his phone with him because people do that and they don't realize that they're even what they're doing. And I think he knew he was going to get lost. And he was like, if I turn it off, they won't know. Or like something along those lines, because he's from Pennsylvania. We looked at the back roads last night. Y'all saw those back roads. Just imagine them at night, no street lights. They're one car one lane, no, there's no uh, markers on the road to tell you to stay in your lane. Uh, you know, those are the kind of roads you'll see a tractor going down. So just very, very strange. I don't know how she's going to combat that. And I wonder if, I just have so many questions for Anne. I wonder when he told her this alibi. Like, I wonder if he told her this from day one and she was just trying to like find some evidence to go along to corroborate this alibi. And now she just kind of like gave up and she's like, maybe somebody, um, you know, maybe somebody, my mind is up Blake. Sorry guys. My mind went Blake. Cause I just saw, is this rich? Is Richie in the chat being Papa Rogers or son? <laughs> That's what made my mind. go Blake. <laughs> saw this mess. <laughs> with the little troll. She's incognito in the chat. You made me lose my train of thought. I don't have notes for that part. <laughs> That's so funny. No matter what um, someone does with their phones, it would be suspicious. Well, I think that if he had a um, a long standing of like his phone dying, like at night, that might work. You know, um, my phone dies like every night. Like look at my, you know, because they're going to look at the phone data. Um, but I think that if he's, um, you know, when you're at home, normally you go to bed around the same time every night, or you settle in the same time and, you know, you got your phone in your hand and you're like, tick it up or texting a boyfriend or girlfriend or doing something on your phone. 
or you're doing something on your Google home or, you know, you're watching your TV, something puts you there like every night. I think that if it's like in his case, I think that if it doesn't look, um, if, you know, if there's a few nights where he, if there's a few nights where he's not there, it's not going to look suspicious. But if there's, if there's no nights where he is not at home, like if he's always at, at home, usually, you know, then it's going to look a little suspicious. <laughs> no laughing, Tanya, and don't buy pants at Target. <laughs> don't tempt me, I will do. I love baby Papa Roger. I'm calling it baby Papa Roger, but I think that's so funny. Why do we know all the Papa Rogers out there too in this chat? Like Elliot comes in, he's Papa Roger. And I'm like, it's Elliot guys. Like, and the only reason why I know who he is is because he is blind like me. And I remembered him like, you know, like, like that's what made me remember him so well. And Taylor's going to build enough reasonable doubt for the jury to scratch their heads. Maybe she might just word salad them. Like, she, like she's been doing kind of with us. Like it's been kind of crazy. Um, I think it has been anyway. Hi, dream catcher. How are you? And how's Ivy doing? Ann Taylor's expert looked at phone data and cams and said, give the state the PCA for your alibi. Only thing they didn't have is him in the house committing the crime. That's true. I think that they might even have more camera heading towards the end of the house. We don't know. You know what I mean? Like there's, they, they may have back cameras back there. I know that they picked up the girls coming home that night. I'm not sure if they just picked up the vehicle on the one, 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 two camera there, like, you know, just going past the home or if it, if there is a camera around the back somehow somewhere and they got them walking into the house or, you know, you just never know. Or there might, that camera that's on the front of that building. If you're standing outside of the 1122 King Road residence and you're like this way and the door's behind you, there is a property right up, right in front of you that has been blurred out. And I believe that there is a camera on there. So they, if he would have entered in the front door, it may have caught him on camera. Or if um, there's a camera around back, it may have caught him going in the back. You never know. Everybody has cameras now. Like, I have security cameras and I live inside of a building. Like there's a locked door downstairs far away from me. It seems like that's locked, secured. And I still have a ring doorbell and I still have, I have a camera now because I kept it, the light bulb camera and the, on our balcony, we live upstairs. Like, but you never know, I guess you never know cameras everywhere. There's a video I'm going to play for you guys too. And it's pretty long, but I think it'll be good. It'll be a good video. I found this and, um, Channing, Channing, um, I can't remember her last name. You know, the girl on court TV that's been following this case since the beginning. She, um, actually figures out, I, I forgot about this video. She figures out that it's Johnson, Idaho, or I'm, I'm sorry, Johnson, Washington, that they're talking about and not Idaho. Um, and she says that in the video, she's like, I think that PCA was wrong on that part. And I was like, girl, you are right. Like it's crazy. There are cameras everywhere now. Brooklyn said, I'm sure they got his ass. I think they did too. I think there's just, there is camera. There are cameras everywhere. I worked at a boutique three years, two years ago, three years ago. And they had 12 cameras on me at all times. And they watched them too. Bet your butt they did. They did. I was like, I don't know why y'all watching me. Um, but this video here goes over the hit Brian Koberger's alleged, um, movements, the night of, or the, the day, I'm sorry, the morning after the homicides, the morning of the homicides after the homicides. Is that what they did on the Murdoch's phone? Okay. Remember cast FBI can get info on your battery life. Yep. They did with Murdoch's phone. All oh, son's phone. Yeah. I remember, um, that was a bad look, wasn't it? When he came in there and he was like. I wasn't at Moselle. I was never there. And then Paul Paul was like, yeah, dad, from the grave, you were there. Remember the dog? He's going to get a chicken. I remember that. I remember, I remember that video so well now. But I think that something like that might even come into play here. You never know. 
could you imagine though? I mean, like what if, um, like even in the Delphi case, they, they recorded Richard Allen. So allegedly Richard Allen. So it's just very strange. Um, let me, of the man oops. accused of, let me rewind it a little bit for you. I was watching this before the live. It's really good. So it's like 28 minutes long. So I'll let it, I'll try to let it play through for the most part, but we'll, we'll probably pause it here and there. Um, so if you guys wouldn't mind before I play the video, smash the like, love to have you, you know, be a part of our, um, Titan team. If you want to become a member, I'll have it linked in the chat for you. And if you would like to subscribe to the channel, we would love to have you be a new subscriber. We're trying to reach 10 or 15,000, 15,000 subscribers now since we got the, the, the 10 or maybe well, we should go higher. No, we'll, we'll start at 15 and then we're going to do another giveaway. So can't beat that. And I reached out to everybody. Um, I emailed everybody back about the giveaway today. Hopefully everyone got their emails and wasn't there something else I wanted to say? I thought there was another something else. But maybe not. <laughs> Richie, there's Richie. <laughs> See, that wasn't him. That wasn't him. He says, remember, I'm just driving around. Thanks for the $5 super sticker. <laughs> Man, that's so funny. <laughs> Um, no, I think the person that called 911 was, uh, I think it was Hunter, uh, Ethan's friend. We don't know for sure, but Daniel from drunk Turkey has had communication with Christy Gonzalez. And he said that Hunter went in and he found them and that he told the girls to get the F out and they called 911. And I th think he called it off one of, he, well, apparently he called it off one of the roommate's phones. So, but, um, take that with a grain of salt, you know, cause I mean, I, I didn't hear it from Christie's mouth. Like, so, but I mean, I don't have any reason to, to not think that she didn't say that. So it's very, that's very, very sad. If true. So I'll play this here for you guys. Don't forget to smash that like. We retraced the bizarre route. Oh, and I want to let you guys know this, this came out like right after he was arrested. So it's been a little while. But it's really good to watch. And then um, I'll play the the PA press conference too, because I thought that was pretty good. It like they are they had so many different people helping arrest him, and I didn't even realize. I thought I knew that like all the agencies that were involved, and I did it. Taken by the man police say murdered four University of Idaho students. We'll show you where he went right after the murders, then follow the path he took the following morning after he returned to the scene of the crime. Court TV is on the ground in Idaho following the evidence. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. It is just a criminal cliche. The criminal always returns to the scene of the crime. I don't know if it's true, but wow, it is it, in this case, the case of the man accused of murdering the four University of Idaho students, Ethan, Zana, Maddie and Kaylee. This to me is a fact that speaks volumes and can be very powerful and very persuasive for a prosecutor in a courtroom like I was. It tells a story like. There's two questions, right, that a lot of people want to know. One is, like, why? Why would he allegedly do that? Why would he kill these four students? Why would he target them? Why? To me, the answer to that is very simple. And it's the same answer as to why the accused killer would return to the scene of the crime. He's a psychopath. He's a psychopathic killer. There's, there's, no, there's no connection to the lives of these people. There's no, there's no rational... Uh, motive that you could speak about or classic motive like money, jealousy, or anything like that. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what I would say to the jury if I were the prosecutor. This is a case, I mean, we could try to get inside his mind, but it's a dangerous place. It's a place where evil lives. The evil that could do what was done here, the same type of psychopathic evil that would want to return to the scene of the crime to see the reaction, to see what people are saying and what's happening there. 
that's who returns to the scene of the crime, ladies and gentlemen. That's what I would argue as, as part of the story. Now, another part of the story, of course, in addition to the why, is, is who? Who? And the who really begins and ends with the DNA that is found on the sheath that is left on the sheets of the bed. This DNA, which, according to the affidavit, matches the DNA of the biological son of the defendant's father. So I'm sure they're doing more testing and will have more testing at trial to connect it to the defendant himself. But that's another part of the story is, is who was there. And, and the evidence is in the DNA, in the, the knife sheath that is found on the sheets. Now, why would it be there, though? Why would, and this is the other question, people wonder, why, well, why would he leave it there? That's sloppy. Well, there's two ways to explain it to a jury. And you don't have to tell them that you know for sure which way it is, because it's not an element of the crime. But again, it's a dangerous place to get into the mind of someone who is an evil, psychopathic killer. Maybe, just maybe, he left it there on purpose to give a, a, a clue so he could sit back and watch how this investigation goes to see if they can actually uh, catch him, knowing that his DNA is not in the system. That's one argument. The other could be just, you know, in what happened that night, the adrenaline and everything that goes along with committing mass murder, you forget things. But you'd have to walk out of there with a knife without a sheath on it. And would you realize that? Was it done on purpose? by a psychopathic killer? I think I could argue that to a jury. Um, but then the jury's going to wonder, where's the knife, though? Where's the murder weapon? And that gets a little more complicated. And, and I think what I would argue is he's not stupid. He's psychopathic, but he's not stupid. He's not going to get caught with the weapon. He's going to try to get rid of that weapon, ladies and gentlemen. He's not going to give investigators a slam dunk. This is a guy who wanted to watch to see if they could figure out who did it based upon little pieces of evidence left behind. Kind of like those psychopathic killers you see in the movies or on Batman. I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about here. Again, th to me, you, you can put all this stuff together. While it doesn't make sense, you don't have the answers, it does make sense, and you, you do have the answers. Now, where could the, the, the knife be? Well, there, it might all be connected to his Hyundai drive the, the, after the murders. Where did he go? And, and tonight, we're going to take a look at that crazy route that he's driving. I guess a quick drive from his apartment to the, to the murder scene, to the crime scene. That's a quick drive back. But that's not what he does. That's not what he does afterwards, and that's not what he does after he returns to the scene of the crime. Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter is tracing those steps tonight. <laughs> Just hours after police say four college students were brutally stabbed inside this home in the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022, the alleged killer returned to the scene. Brian Koberger's cell phone allegedly shows him here at 9.12 a.m. and staying for about 10 minutes. But that isn't the only location police placed Koberger that day in the hours after the murders. According to the probable cause affidavit, Brian Koberger's cell phone records show him moving south from Pullman, Washington, where he lived in an on-campus apartment at Washington State University, towards Lewiston, Idaho, about a 50-minute drive. The town of Lewiston is located on the border of Washington State, or just across the Snake River, is the bordering town of Clarkston, Washington. It was here at approximately 12.36 p.m. November 13th, 2022, when cell phone records placed Koberger's vehicle here on Port Drive next to Kate's Cup of Joe coffee stand. The surveillance videos here at the U.S. Chef's store show his white Hyundai Elantra drive past. Then just 10 minutes later at 12.46 p.m., that camera that um, he went by is like a fisheye camera, I think that's what they're called, or like dome camera, Vincent would know. Um, but they have like pretty good video on those, like really good video. 
normally. So I think that um, it'll probably catch, it might not catch the license plate, but it'll definitely catch the car and maybe even like the person in the car. And they maybe not like details, but uh, man or woman, you could probably guess those kind of things. It might even be able to see a little bit better than that. Koberger's cell phone records place him at the nearby Albertson's grocery store. Surveillance video at 12.49 p.m. shows Koberger walking through the store and purchasing unknown items at the checkout. He leaves at approximately 1.04 p.m. The probable cause affidavit does not indicate location data for the next few hours of the day. It isn't until around 5.30 p.m. that the affidavit indicates Koberger's cell phone located in Johnson, Idaho. But there is no Johnson, Idaho. The affidavit may have meant this community of Johnson, Washington, right on the border of Idaho State. It's a location consistent with the affidavit's route and it's surrounded by cell phone towers. For three minutes from 5.32 to 5.36 p.m. November 13, 2022, Koberger's cell phone pings here near the community of Johnson. But then his cell phone goes dark for three hours. The affidavit notes that this location in Johnson is consistent with the phone being in the same area that it traveled in the hours immediately following the murders. And according to the affidavit, from 5.36 p.m. when it was in Johnson until 8.30 p.m. November 13th, Koberger's phone stopped reporting to the network, meaning he turned it off, put it in airplane mode, or the phone was in an area without cell coverage. While the probable cause affidavit does provide new revelations into the movements of the alleged killer in the hours after the murders, there were... What if, I just wanted to pause it here. Um, first off, how did he know where the, like that, those places were? Like those back roads, you have to know where you're going. To get on those back roads like I don't see those back roads coming up on Google Maps like you know what I mean as you're usually if you're like you put in Google Maps it's, it sends you the direct route it doesn't take you like back roads and those are definitely back roads also if you look behind Channing right now I think that's her name Channing um you see the blue house with the awning over it I'm not saying that there is but there could have been a camera on the back of that house somewhere. Um, and it looks like if that would be facing towards the back slider door. So the, it may have caught something on there. The girls arriving home or um, the person going in and, and entering the home, exiting the home. He had traveled them with prior visits, Jan said. I, I believe so too. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a crazy, crazy back road. Still many questions that remain. Why did he drive so far to the grocery store? What did he buy there? Did he get rid of that murder weapon and other incriminating evidence along the way? Or during that three hour period, his phone went dark. For now, we wait and answers may only come during his trial. Reporting in Moscow, Idaho, Chanley Painter, Court TV. That is eye opening. Absolutely eye opening when you talk about what it looks like out there and the places he went. Middle of nowhere, folks. Let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, who was in the middle of nowhere today, but tonight she's joining us from Washington State University campus, uh, where the defendant used to work and study. Chanley, great to see you. Wow. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the places that he visited. I mean, that is so revealing, the, the video actually getting to see what these roads and towns look like. There's nobody there. Exactly. So uh, I'm really pleased that we were able to bring this to our viewers because this is about a 15 minute drive. We're here in Pullman, Washington. I'm not far from his apartment here on Washington State University campus. And you would head directly south again for almost an hour. We're virtually nothing. You're surrounded by just fields, farmland. Uh, you can see, though, there's a lot of cell phone towers between here and Lewiston-Clarkston area, uh, which makes me believe that 
a phone would not be without cell phone service in any of the areas. I did not experience that in any of the places as rural as we were uh, trying to retrace the movements of Brian Koberger based on his cell phone uh, on November 13th, 2022, as well as, um, you know, today. So here's some video. I mean, this is what it looks like. This uh, is video of the Snake River where it intersects with Clearwater River. This is really on the border of Washington State and uh, Idaho, where Lewiston and Clarkston are, uh, that we showed you in the package. And, you know, speaking to so many locals as we made this trek yesterday and today, this is a river that moves swiftly, Benny. It's a fast-moving river. There's a lot of uh, fishing boats out on the river. Is this a... Y'all, that was not in a fast-moving river. We saw that on the pictures. I we remember we were looking at them earlier, and you couldn't even see the water hardly moving. I'm gonna just rewind it like one little second so you can see where she points, because like to me that doesn't look like. <clears throat> I'm gonna play it, but it doesn't look like it's fast moving to me. But then again, maybe it's faster than what it looks like on the you know on the video. But I I'm thinking that if he didn't for some reason I think he. Whoever did this, I think he buried the knife. I don't know why I do think that, but I, for some reason, I think that he buried the knife. Um, if he didn't, this is one hell of a place to throw it. Look at that. I mean, really, where, where would you even begin to look? So it looks very slow to me too. <laughs> She's like, this is a fast river. Is she, is she from the city? Cause I'm, I'm kind of country, not that country, but I do kayak sometimes and stuff. So. Didn't look like it. I mean, it looked like you could just set your boat out there. You'd be fine. It's moving river. Oh, oh, thank you, Mindy, for gifting memberships. I just saw that. Oh, thank you. Linda and Jackie Sue got one and Miriam and Shauna. And War, War Flair. There's a lot of uh, fishing boats out on the river. Is this a possible spot where items could have been discarded along this journey and this trip and you know, where his phone last pinged in Johnson, Washington area, which uh, we had to do some court TV investigation to find this area of Johnson, Vinny. Uh, the, the affidavit says Johnson, Idaho. There is not a Johnson, Idaho. We believe, based on our investigation, based on what this affidavit says, Johnson, Washington, it's a community, it's a neighborhood, uh, it's an old farming uh, community, neighborhood, as they call it, where there are so many cell phone towers. So he could have actually either been in Johnson, here's a map depicting this route that we took, or he could have been close by. He could have been on the main 195 highway and still pinged on the tower serving the Johnson, Washington area or even anywhere around that area uh, because there are so many towers. So it was just interesting to see the remoteness of the drive from here in Pullman, Washington, south to Lewiston and Clarkson, the, the next major town. There's the only sign in the state of Washington to Johnson right there that we just showed. Uh, we scoured the area. Uh, there is if you put in Google Maps, just to mention in Idaho, a Johnson, Idaho, Google Maps will take you about two and a half hours from here towards the Nez Perce National Forest. Uh, that is not a town. It is a road called Johnson Road. Uh, it could have been an old kind of community or what they call a gray farming grange here in this part of the U.S. But uh, that put that location that it just does not fit with the facts of the affidavit saying that this particular location in Johnson would have been consistent with the route he took immediately after the murders hours before, allegedly. That's amazing that you picked up uh, on a mistake in the affidavit. And it's understandable because in, in I mean, Washington, Idaho, right next to each other, um, traveling back and forth, back and forth. It's, it's a little sloppy. I'll give you that. Absolutely sloppy. Um, but what you're saying makes a lot more sense than being two and a half hours away on some road because it, that, that, does, that makes no sense. And this is much more consistent. Uh, it, it seemed like there was a lot of flat land uh, that you were driving over. Is that, is that uh, consistent with what you experienced today or is, is it it's, rolling hills? It doesn't seem to be any sort of hills. dense wooded areas, though. No, no dense wooded areas. That was the two and a half hours away, which we did drive that yesterday. Uh, that was hilly. But this route that 
he is alleged in this affidavit, is rolling hills, farmland, not a lot of trees, uh, remoteness. There are creeks, small rivers that possibly things could be disposed of, uh, but there are a lot of also gravel roads. So when we're going to Johnson community in Washington on the border there, you have to take a couple gravel roads, Benny, to actually reach that community. Uh, and this is what it looks like. Uh, well, this is from today. Uh, we took this on our drive to the community of Johnson, but this is what it looks like. Not a lot of trees. And remember when he was making this around 530 at night, it would have been dark at the time that he was pinging from these multiple cell phone towers in that area. Yes. Yeah, so, and I mean, Super dark, uh, no street lights, unbelievable, and it makes no sense. It may, I mean, I, I don't. I'm trying to think of a, a reason to go down there. I mean, Albertsons is great. Love Albertsons, but um, I'm sure there's a place a little bit closer that you could go to. Yes, you don't are. need to go to that one. All right, let's let's talk about um, what's happening at the University of, of Idaho. Uh, students coming back to campus, and students come back to campus probably at Washington State also. Absolutely. Today was the first day back for Washington State University where I'm standing, but the University of Idaho, about 20 minutes from here across the border, their first day is Wednesday. But, Vinny, I can already tell I was there earlier today. Such a difference, a stark difference from the end of last semester when we were here reporting on this case to just this week and the days leading up to the semester beginning there at University of Idaho, a lot more students and presence of people and vehicles in the area, even near the crime scene. And you can just tell that uh, from all those I've talked to, there's a sense of relief. Let's take a listen to someone I caught up with today. I think with the arrest, um, a lot more people feel a bit safer to come back. But I, I still think there's a little bit of fear going around just because it, we haven't seen anything like this for about seven years. And so it's just a bit shocking to this community. And then here on the campus of Washington State University, today was the first day back. It was so busy. In fact, there were tons of students in this media area until just earlier, uh, uh, just a little while ago. Uh, but we've heard everything from uh, students being glad now that there's this arrest, they're thankful, they're feeling okay from even a student telling me he was angry that the police said, oh, there's no threat, there's no threat. And then turns out the person was here, someone that went to school with them and lived so close. But actually, remember, Brian Kohlberger, he went to school here. He was in his first semester as a graduate student working on his PhD in criminology, criminal justice, a building that's right behind me to my right. And he also, as a part of that program, Vinny, was a teaching assistant and helped teach, get this, a criminal law class last semester. And I met one of his students today. Let's watch. He was my TA last semester and uh, he basically just graded our papers and um, was there if we needed extra help outside of class. He wasn't always there. He would come in, be there for 10 minutes, leave, not say much. So. He didn't really do that much, but you could tell there was something off about him. Very quiet. Um. So for the person in the, my comment section that yelled at me and said that Brian was a teacher the other day, he wasn't. He was a TA that was barely there. You heard it from the, his little student's mouth. Um, calculated about what he says. Um and you can kind of see that <laughs> in the videos of him. So this is that Scott, his student, Vinny. This was a criminal law class. So here we have Brian Koberger teaching college students criminal law procedure process unfolding. And guess who's living that out right now? Brian Koberger. Uh, the student uh, goes on to tell me that not only was he very quiet, uh, but that he was a tough grader in class, but he was just not that talkative. And he told me that the Koberger that we're seeing in court, you know, walk in, uh, that's kind of stoic, is the exact same demeanor that he exhibited in class, Benny. No change. This was, um, Therese, this was Johnson, um, I, or Johnson, Washington. They switched it. Um, so in the first probable cause that came out, the officers put, they, they did a, they did a mistake. They, they put it in under Johnson, Idaho. We looked through Johnson, Idaho, and I found there is a Johnson, Idaho. 
It's a little, small, little dot of a nothing town. And it's like two hours from where he's from. And there's so many different parks and recreational places and reservoirs to that spot that we did a whole live on it, thinking that he probably took the knife and threw it in one of those reservoirs. Um, but then the second PCA came out and it made the correction that it was Johnson, Washington, which is only like, I think a half hour from his house, 40, maybe 45 minutes. Um, but Chani actually, this is before the second PCA came out and she makes the connection before the second PCA even came out. I was like, she good. She's like really good. She did a good job on this. She's done a good job on this case. I feel like. Yeah, they came back and they corrected in the second PCA. Um, and then in the one for Pennsylvania, I just noticed it. It says Johnson, Idaho as well. But the second PCA, they did correct it. Very weird. But yeah, they were like, we messed up on the this date. Because we did a whole live on it. <laughs> I was like, I remember Isabel was here. I remember her being here for that. Because we were both going, oh my gosh, like all these reservoirs. <laughs> like all the water. I remember that part of the live. But yeah, so this video is a little, this is old. That's why we're kind of playing it. Um, we did, this is like part three of Brian's move, alleged movements the night of the um, the crime. So this is, so on Friday Night's Live, we did from him going from his, um, his house from, I'm sorry, from the crime scene to his house. And then Saturday we did from his house to the crime scene. And then tonight we're doing the next day, his movements the next day. So, um, you know, he showed up at the crime scene between 9.12 and 9.21 a.m., and then he went to went home and then he went to Kate's cup of um, cup of Joe. Is that what it's called? The coffee shop. And then to the Albertsons, like 45 minutes or 40 minutes from his house. And then he went to Johnson, Washington, where there is a reservoir there um, that we were looking at. Like, and you could, it's a bridge that you have to cross to get back home. So he definitely could have thrown it there. And, and the series is great. I mean, that's scary, right? This was this was his TA. This was a guy who was still out there and about. And you don't know if he's accused of committing four murders. What would stop him from five, six, yeah. seven, eight? Uh, he's in he's in custody now, though. All right, Chanley, stay where you are. We got more. We have more with uh, Chanley Painter. We're going to zero in on some of the areas uh, where the murder weapon maybe could be because there's a lot of time spent there off the radar. We'll zero in on that. Plus, coming up next hour. In Newport News, Virginia, a six-year-old boy accused of bringing a gun to school and purposely shooting his teacher who survived. What should happen to this six-year-old and what about his parents? No matter. Live updates. Use in court during the trial. Uh, take a look here. This is the... the Chanley Painter is on the ground with all we know about the alleged killer and what's next. We'll have the latest details on the investigation. Live updates all this week on Me Too. The cell phone evidence in the Idaho case, to me, very, very revealing and telling and powerful uh, for prosecutors to use in court during the trial. Uh, take a look here. This is the, the cell phone movements before and after the murders. 2.42 a.m., uh, the defendant's phone pings at 1630 Northeast Valley Road, apartment G201, Pullman, Washington. 247 for about five minutes, his phone data is consistent with him leaving his apartment, traveling through Pullman, Washington. 448 a.m., this is afterwards now. His phone does not report to the network again until approximately 448, locating the phone in Idaho State Highway 95, south of Moscow, near Blaine, Idaho, 5.30. The phone is consistent traveling back to his apartment. So with this, you can take a look. If you connect the dots, right, and you've got this strange loop going south from Moscow down and then back up to uh, Pullman, a drive if you go straight, like 10, 10 12 minutes. Um, let's bring back in Court TV legal correspondent, Chanley Painter. Um Let's talk about later that morning now, Chanley. I started the whole segment tonight talking about a criminal returning to the crime, uh, the scene of the crime, which is what they allege here. Uh, what did he do that morning and later that day? 
interesting the next morning without turning his cell phone off taking it with him in the white Hyundai Elantra he makes the most direct path from his apartment here in Pullman to Moscow where the crime scene is according to this affidavit at 9 12 a.m he's in Moscow Idaho at the crime scene stays about 10 minutes and then returns back on that direct route to Pullman he's home by 9 32 I believe is what the affidavit says so then at, later that afternoon he makes his way south 1236 he is now south about 50 minutes away in Clarkston Washington through Lewiston at Kate's Cup of Joe he doesn't get a cup of coffee there he doesn't stop in and get a cup of coffee he's driving past this his phone pings there and the neighbor across the parking lot that U.S. Chef's store catches his white Hyundai Elantra driving past on their surveillance video at 12 46 p.m. and then at well at 12 46 p.m. just down the road couple blocks away, he's at Albertson's grocery store. It's all right there together, Vinny. He's going in the store. He's seen all surveillance video. I've been in this store. I, there are security cameras all over this store. They can see what he's buying. They don't say it in the affidavit, but they can see what he's buying. There are security cameras above the checkout counters, so they know what he bought there. They just aren't telling us, Vinny. Um, and his uh, Hyundai Elantra is seen there as well. He leaves Albertson's about 1.04 p.m. Then there are several hours where the affidavit doesn't say where he is. They probably know where he is, but they aren't saying. So at 532 and 536 for three minutes, he is in Johnson. Now, not Johnson, Idaho, like the affidavit says, my court TV investigation shows that this is the likely area, Johnson, Washington, it's a community there. His phone goes dark, it last pings in this area, and it goes dark for three hours, 530 to 830 p.m. And this area of Johnson, maybe 20 minutes from his home you go north there's a couple of ways you can get back on the main highway and go into pullman or there's a back way on johnson road that also brings you in here to pullman uh Vinny. so is there any overlap is it is it the same route that they allege right after the murders because i'm looking at it and we had a loop and i see kind of like half a loop there what can you tell us yeah there is many and the affidavit points this out that the where his phone is pinging there at Johnson is consistent with the same route he took hours before allegedly immediately after the murders here's the maps put together and you can see where they coincide with each other so he's returning to a lot of the similar areas that his phone pinged in the immediate hours after the murder I've spoken again with my investigation to a lot of locals there especially around the Johnson area and there is a well-known back road that gets you from Moscow to Pullman. It is called Thorn Creek Road. It's the white line you see kind of cutting in between Highway 95 and 195. I was just about to cut her off because yeah, she has her mappy wrong, her maps wrong. So the white line where um, 95 is, I showed you guys this last night actually on maps. I was pulling it up on maps as she was talking because I was like, that's not right. Um, let me see if I can show you guys. Um, got to go to directions. Okay. Let's see here. Um, is it not going to show up? Well, now that like the line isn't showing up. If I go, like I'm going to drive it this way. Okay, so um, it's not coming up like it did yesterday. Oh, no, it is. Okay, so let me share this with you guys really quick. So I'm like, this is like a little, they, he went a little different route. So um, basically, this is like, if he, don't worry about this line, or the, the blue line is if he were to go from his house and step to apartment straight over to um, the King Road residence. But on his way back, to his house he goes from moscow and he goes down 95 before he gets to genesis it says and the pca he goes on this road which is um thorpe the one that she's talking about and this is the road now this part of thorpe you it has the lines but parts of it doesn't don't even have the lines let me see if i can go back oh and um show you guys when we were looking on it last night, like parts of the road, 
maybe it does, but um, very small road. No, this isn't the right one. I'm sorry, guys. It's Thorpe. I don't know why it's not. This has put me on Union Town. Because I'm hitting the wrong one, probably. Okay, I'll show it to you guys here in a minute. I'll play the video while I'm getting it together that way. You guys don't have to listen to um, or watch me do it. But this road, it's basically right here, the 95. And that's the route that he came back. He like cut um, through a back road. So he would have had to known that road was there. It's just a really weird spot to kind of go down that road. So let me show you guys the video and then I'll pull it back up. Because we saw it last night. Um, I might have just been on the wrong on the wrong white line because there's two there five and one's idaho one's washington it crosses the state lines there it is a back road less people no cameras but it's paved it is well known here because used to back in the day Vinny, moscow had a drinking age of 19 so people would come to moscow over state lines drink and they didn't want to do, take that direct route back over the state lines so they would go this kind of a horseshoe shape the back roads and then come up from pullman from the back way to avoid onlookers and so that is what it looks like here and what could be a likely spot and um he probably maybe know, knew this okay i found it thorpe or, or thorn it's paid but it doesn't have i was like i know that road didn't have um lines so it's just one like a one car kind of can fit down it um it has the gravel on the sides if you guys are from the country you hit that gravel and you're off the side of the road so at night there's no, sh there's no, um, there's no cameras around this area normally. And there's at night, there's no street lights. So it makes sense if to go back this route, I mean, and to cut across and stay off of the main highway. If you think about it, but I wanted to make sure I showed you guys that cause that was getting me. Let me put it back on for you guys. <laughs> and then it seems to go down south again to this area, stopping at Albertsons and driving past the coffee shop. Well, the whole thing, the whole thing's just crazy. And we're learning, you know, more and more every day. Um, I kind of reference it to what you would call an old bootleggers road. It's just the easy way back and forth, and it is the road less traveled. So, of course, that's the way he's going to try to move. Um, in terms of going back to the scene of the crime the next day, the one thing that I get stuck on, this was a massive situation. And at one point, he was going to check the news. No coverage, no anything, no mention of this. Um, if he had a conscious at all, I would expect he was starting to get nervous. Then he goes back and checks, no activity. By then, I might make a couple stops and, and consider heading out of town. Bobby Chacon, one of my thoughts here is that we don't have a murder weapon and... You know, there's opportunity, it seems, in this route, lots of places. Do you think there's any chance, if, if the killer ditched the knife somewhere along this, this, this horseshoe-shaped route between Moscow and Pullman, is there any chance of finding it? Well, sure, there's a chance. I mean, it's a large area, and it's a difficult way to search. You know, for 19 years, I ran the FBI's underwater search and re recovery team. So, um, if, you know, when I peaked up when Chanley was talking about those rivers, because my team would be in the water searching, you know, those those bodies of water. That's typically what we did. Um, you know, it's also possible if he didn't bury it, that a hunter comes across it or somebody walking their dog comes across it. So I think people along these routes should be, you know, on the lookout because we can enlist the community's help in, in this kind of thing. So, um you know, it, it's a long area. It would be tough to even know where to start to search if you were actually going to do a search without anything to go on. Um, but it's it's possible that somebody else finds it, somebody out in the community, if their heads up, finds it. Or if they have, you know, we used to do hunch searches, we, we called hunch searches, where I, I drop my team under a bridge, you know, just as a hunch that, that it might be there without any other information indicating it was there. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's possible. 
um, if he didn't do a good job, or even if he, you know, a lot of criminals think that just because they throw something in the water, um, it's gone forever. And that's my team proved that wrong over and over again. Um, and so, um, yeah, it, it is possible. So, um, uh, Bob, we just have a couple seconds here, though. I'm just trying to picture this. So you said you drop your team under a bridge. So um, how many people would go in there and um, how visible are there machines to try to figure out the, or is it just what you're looking at? No, it's, the, it's zero visibility. We'd use metal detectors, handheld metal detectors. We put a grid under the bridge. We know how far approximately out a, a person could possibly throw it. We'd set up a grid and we'd systematically cover the grid. And then we would expand the grid if we don't find it. We use metal detectors because it'd be pitch black. Um, but we we would always find what we we're looking for using that method. And, and we would search, you know, large areas and just keep expanding the search area until we, you know, found it or, or ruled it out too far to throw off the bridge. Okay, so I looked up. Oh, you, oh, don't you do that to me? I looked up um, what states have, um, like what are like body camera like laws by state, um, and it says these states are California, Connecticut, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Maryland, Minnesota, Nebraska, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Mexico, Ohio, Oregon, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Texas, Utah, Virginia, Washington and Wisconsin. Those are the ones that are required to. But, um, well, hold on. Well, that's kind of confusing because that says, do, hold on. It says, do all cops, U.S. cops have body cams? 47% of the general purpose law enforcement agencies had acquired body cams, worn cameras for large police departments. That number is 80%. 60% of local police departments and 49% of sheriff's offices. So I guess it's just they're, they're, they're moving them in slowly but surely. Yeah, Pennsylvania does not. I didn't think that Pennsylvania did. I thought I heard that somewhere. So I, was, I figured we would look that one up too. Um, I'm going to go through the, this, little, this really quick. It's just the timeline that I... I made this timeline back in... Um, January, right after he was arrested. So it's old. I had to update it last time that we showed it, um, like a part of it, the Johnson Idaho part. Um, so you'll you'll see that in here too. But I figured it would just be nice to touch over the whole, like not the whole timeline, but most of the timeline, um, to kind of like, you know, end out this part of the saga that we were going over. And then we can watch the um, Pennsylvania con press conference if you guys would like to do that. I haven't seen it since. Well, I saw it today, but I hadn't, I didn't see all of it. I didn't watch all of it, but I watched most of it. Um, but I didn't watch it. And I don't think I watched it again since they first had the press conference. I kind of forgot about Pennsylvania having one to, to tell you the truth. So today, um, when I was listening to it, they were going through like all the agencies that helped apprehend Brian Kohlberger. And I actually was interested in listening to that part because normally I'm just like, oh, don't talk about yourselves, you know, like let's get to the, the good stuff. But it was nice to listen to who did what and what agencies were all involved? Because it was a lot um, of different agencies. I know there are people out there that say um, that the cops are corrupt. Well, which cops? I mean, there's so many different agencies that work this case that it would be damn near impossible. I mean, for every agency to be like, oh, okay, I'm going to go on that. Oh, okay, I'm going to go on that. Let's just fry this guy that we don't know, you know. So um, I just want to let you guys know that. But it's, this is the Brian Kohlberger timeline. It says at 9 or 3.29 a.m., the white Elantra is seen doing passes by the King Road residence. Um, at 4.04, surveillance shows the vehicle. That's when it's doing like the U-turns and parking between the intersections of King and Queen Road. Um, 4.04 to 4.07 a.m., Dylan hears Kaylee with Murphy, then hears someone say, or hears someone say there's someone here. I just kind of made that. This is my timeline. This is what, in my head. Um that part is. So this would have been after the suspect had entered. So I think that's when the suspect had entered was between 404 and 407. Um, and then at 420, the suspect um, suspect vehicle is seen leaving the home. And then 912 a.m. the next morning to 921 a.m. Phone was back in the area of the murder scene. And then let me see here. Uh, let me try this one. 
At 1236, Brian's phone is pinged and is traveling from Pullman, Washington to Lewiston, Idaho. Estimated time, 39 minutes. Um, and then at that time, Brian's phone is located at Kate's Cup of Joe Coffee in Clarkson, Washington. 1246 to 104 p.m., Brian is seen on surveillance at a grocery store called Albertson's. What he bought is unknown. Um, 536 to 830. You can see there's like two here. Um, but Brian's phone stops reporting to the network then and Brian's phone shows up in the first for the first PCA Johnson, Idaho, one hour, 34 minutes from Albertson's and two hours from his house in Pullman. And then we figured out, nope, second PCA came out. Second PCA correction was Brian's phone shows up in Johnson, Washington and stops reporting to the network from 536 to 830 that night. Um, let me rewind this. I got about halfway done with it. And is there anything? I just want to see what else I want to show you guys before we do this. Okay, so we'll go ahead and we'll go to this video here. Have you guys seen this? Um, the Pennsylvania one? It's been forever. I, I forgot about it. So I think it'll be a good um, watch. And it's pretty loud too, so I could hear everything. I don't know about the questions at the end, but we'll see. Um, We'll see where we get to. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lieutenant Adam Reed. I'm the director of the communications office with the Pennsylvania State Police. Thank you for joining us here. The order of speakers is going to be our Pennsylvania State Police Commissioner, Colonel Robert Ivanchik, Major Christopher Paris, he's our Area 3 Commander, and First, Assistic, First Assistant District Attorney of Monroe County, Mike Mancuso. After the speakers have finished, we will then take a handful of questions. Colonel Ivanchik. Good afternoon. I'm Colonel Robert Ivanchik, Commissioner of the Pennsylvania State Police. While I monitored the investigation into the horrific murders of the University of Idaho students, I did not imagine the investigation would lead to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. My heart goes out to the families of the victims, their friends, the community of Moscow, and the University of Idaho. No words can heal the pain associated with the loss of a child. Their young lives were ended far too soon. In law enforcement, we understand the best thing we can do for victims and their families is to follow every lead, collect every piece of evidence, and bring those responsible to justice. I am proud of the members of the Pennsylvania State Police who were able to help in this investigation. The cooperative relationship between our local, state, and federal partners stands the test of time. The officers, troopers, and federal agents work together tirelessly, putting in long, difficult hours. Communication and cooperation are imperative to success and to ensure the integrity of the case remains maintained. The culmination of that cooperation ultimately led to take the suspect into custody and afforded the families some sense of peace they deserve. I wanna thank the Moscow Police Department the Idaho State Police, and our partners in the Federal Bureau of Investigation for their support, assistance, and coordination. I also want to recognize the Monroe County District Attorney's Office. And finally, I need to acknowledge the members of the Pennsylvania State Police, specifically members of Troop N, our Bureau of Criminal Investigation, and our Bureau of Emergency and Special Operations who assisted in safely taking the suspect into custody in the early morning hours of December 30th. As previously indicated by Chief James Fry of the Moscow Police Department, specific details regarding this investigation cannot be released until the suspect is extradited to Idaho and presented with the probable cause affidavit. At this time, I will turn the microphone over to Major Christopher Paris, 
commander of Area 3, who was involved in the coordinated efforts to take the suspect into custody. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, Area 3 comprises troops F, P, N, and R, and is made up of 1,000 approximately of the women and men, civilian and enlisted in the northeastern part of uh, Pennsylvania. I'd like to introduce to my left, Captain Norm Kramer, who's the commander of Troop N Hazelton, which is comprised of Carbon, Monroe, Columbia, and parts of Luzerne counties. I would like to reiterate, as the Colonel said, that Idaho law prohibits any release of information contained within the affidavits. Um, so we're going to do our best today to talk about what phase we are currently in in the investigation. And it has entered a new phase with the waiver for extradition. And the continuing primary goal is the seeking of justice through successful prosecution and conviction, bearing the burden of proof, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So with that in mind, we're trying to balance essentially two things, the public's desire for information against the need to maintain the integrity of the investigation and protect the subjects, suspects, excuse me, uh, accused at this point's due process. So I'll now attempt to give you an operational picture with the best information I can release at the time. So this begins when the Pennsylvania State Police Bureau of Criminal Investigation troopers were contacted by the FBI about assisting with surveillance of the accused in this case. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to specifically thank several individuals. Uh, Special Agent Charge Jackie McGuire and Assistant Special Agent in Charge Dave Carter from the Philadelphia Field Division, as well as Supervisory Special Agent Bill Vigorito of the Scranton RA. They're going to go through all the officers. I know usually like I don't really like listening to it, but I actually enjoyed listening to them because, you know, this is a little different with it being Brian. Um, but I did see where Mindy said, wasn't he arrested in PA? And I'm guessing he was wearing some kind of pajama wear. Actually, he was wearing clothing that you would wear um, just kind of. You could, okay, um, you could either wear these clothes, like, out to go, like, groceries, or you could, I guess, wear them to bed, but he was wearing, like, a long sleeve Under Armour shirt, Under Armour shorts, boxers, sh socks, and shoes. He was dressed like he was going on a run, or he was dressed like he, if, in case he needed to run, <laughs> you know, however you want to take it, but, yeah, he was fully dressed, which is so crazy. Hi, Kelly D., how are you doing? Richie said, if you all see Papa Roger's son, I'd love to interview him. Uh, we're very lucky in PSP uh, to have a collaborative relationship with the Bureau, both in Pennsylvania and beyond, and their people are absolutely excellent. So as the investigation progressed, Troop N Criminal Investigation Section, commanded by Captain Kramer over my left shoulder here, began to collaborate with authorities in Idaho. Specifically, I'd like to acknowledge Lieutenant James Curdo, who was here today, Sergeant Anthony Ferdinand, Corporal John Chulock, who is not present with us, and Troopers Leary and Knoll, who are here with us today. Uh, it was through this collaboration and the charges pending in Idaho that uh, those troopers were able to obtain search warrants and a fugitive from justice warrant that was prepared here in Monroe County for the location in Chestnut Hill Township and the Fugitive from Justice Warrant for Mr. Koberger, respectively. I'd like to acknowledge the Monroe County District Attorney, David Christine, as well as First Assistant Mike Mancuso and their entire office. The support that we received was absolutely excellent. Once those warrants were obtained, the Bureau of Emergency and Special Operations, BSO, coordinates our Special Emergency Response Team, CERT. They were selected to serve those warrants, the three search warrants and the Fugitive from Justice Warrant. To define what CERT is, it's a full-time tactical team maintained by PSP to deal with high-risk warrant situations, barricades, and other incidents requiring specialized tactical training or other capabilities. From their perspective, we essentially task them to go out and serve a um, arrest warrant for someone accused of a quadruple murder. They're activated several hundred times a year throughout the Commonwealth. 2.30 a.m., I thought it was 1.30 a.m. that they apprehended him. I believe it looks like it was 2. Oh, wait, hold on. Sorry, I'm just kidding. That was the wrong time. I thought that was the right time. Because this was the flight path. Because I thought it was like 4 in the morning but before 2, but then I thought I read somewhere that it was 1.30. So let me continue to look, and if you guys know in the chat, let me know. 
We don't typically hear of their work in a forum mm -hmm. like this because they serve the warrant, the person's taken into custody, and they go about their, their assignment. They are the ultimate professionals. It's a volunteer team. They're highly trained and highly motivated. Captain Norm Kramer over my left shoulder was assigned as the top com for the CERT activation, which means he was responsible for coordinating our tactical preparations. So tactical assets were then staged in the county, in Monroe County, uh, into the evening of Thursday, December 29th, last Thursday. And in the early hours of Friday, December 30th, those warrants were executed at the location. Mr. Koberger was taken into custody without incident. The scene was turned over to the FBI evidence response team for processing. Mr. Koberger was then turned over to the Monroe County Prison, where he has remained in their custody since. I'd like to thank the Monroe County Sheriff and the Stroud Regional Police Department for their support as well during the extradition process. Arrangements currently are being made to deliver Koberger back to Idaho, where he can have continued due process and face these charges. So it's with that, I will turn it over to First Assistant Mike Mancuso. Thank you, Major. Now, this guy here, when he comes up to talk, <laughs> I like him. I like him a lot. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Mike Mancuso with the DA's office, the first assistant district attorney. Uh, I want to give my uh, condolences to the families of the victims um, out in Idaho uh, for their loss. And it's my sincere hope that uh, this marks a clear step in the right direction of effectuating justice for those folks. Um, my office's role was uh, relatively recent. Uh, we weren't um, advised of the presence uh, of the defendant in our county until um, only a couple days uh, before the apprehension of the defendant. Uh, but when we were told, uh, we came together and worked very closely uh, with uh, Captain uh, Kramer, who did an excellent job in uh, almost like a clockwork operation. Uh, part of uh, my duties um, were to ensure that three separate search warrants uh, were issued. Uh, those affidavits attached to those search warrants are still under seal, so I can't discuss their contents with you. Uh, but one was for the person of uh, Mr. Koberger, uh, collecting DNA and photographs, that sort of thing. One was for the uh, white Elantra vehicle uh, which um, I understand uh, has been seized and uh, is being processed. And one was for the address, the residence itself that he was living in with his family. Uh so when they seized his car, remember when we got, and um, this is before they let the, um, before the search warrants were out. So um, do you, I've never, cause I've, I've never heard of them doing it this way. Um, they, when they seized his vehicle, they said that they took like the brake pedal, the, all the pedals, like they were taking about like the brake pedal, the gas pedal, the door, the seat, um, and stuff of that nature. Do you think that they just took the whole physical vehicle? And then once they got it to their impound lot, that's when they removed the items that they were taking, because I don't see them just going into Kohlberger's parents' garage and hooking it up and like taking out these parts and then just not, and then just leaving a shell of a car there. I'm just, I'm like, I was like so worried about that. So I'm not, uh, let me know what you guys think. Um, they probably, I'm, I'm assuming that they took the car to their impound lot. You know, they towed it there and then um, they went through it. Then you would think that's what, it, yeah, they would have had it towed. Marianne said, I know. I'm like, <laughs> would think so but when they described it in the search warrant they didn't state that they took the vehicle they just said that we took like the paneling and the, this and that and the other and i'm like well did they even take the car because that would be so bad they just like not like bad but you know just like the shell of a car there like you can have that you can keep that part because i know that they probably want the whole thing just in case they need to go back and take other parts of the vehicle out you know if you don't find maybe you know, um, stuff on the driver's side, maybe it would be on the passenger side. If there was an extra person that was helping him, we'll say, you know, they would probably check both sides, I would say. Um, I was at the scene um, and I have to say um, that uh, uh, Major Paris and uh, Captain uh, Norm Kramer did an outstanding job in coordinating the efforts, not only of the numerous Pennsylvania State uh, Police Troopers there, but um, 
officers from other jurisdictions and disciplines within those jurisdictions to make this a very smooth, highly competent professional operation. Um, it is a, a quirk apparently, it's uh, not in the norm uh, of the states I'm familiar with that Idaho does not release their probable cause affidavit in support of their arrest warrant until after uh, their defendant is uh, brought or uh, returned to that state. Um, but having uh, read those documents and the uh, sealed affidavits of probable cause, I definitely believe that one of the main reasons the defendant chose to waive extradition and hurry his return back to Idaho was the need to know what was in those documents. Hmm. I like him. He said he, he wanted to get his ass back to Idaho because he wanted to know what was inside those documents. And I agree, sir. I agree with that. I, I, I agree with that. If I was his parents, I'd be making noise. If I was his parents, I would be freaking out right now. I would at least be out there. Um, I would at least be out there like, you know, and then I would be in the media saying something about my kid. I, I just would, you know, you don't let your kid go down for quadruple homicides. I mean, even if they're telling you to stay quiet, there's no way in this world. There's no way in this, on this whole planet, if my father was on this planet today and I did something like this, he would, he'd be like, no, not my kid. And he'd be out there like, you know, trying to get me out of trouble, even if he knew I did it. Cause like, that's what, you know, that's what dads do for their daughters. Like, they're like, oh, you commit a crime. We're going to help you. Like, you know, you would think that his parents would be out saying something. I don't know. Just something. Um, well, he's, I mean, he wants a speedy trial. So I think they, and the, the defense attorneys say that they're on, on, Target to go October 2nd. They haven't even mentioned the 37 day extension they have. It's really weird. I love that Brooklyn. Yeah. When Brian Etten was at the Kohlberger house and he, he like, pan, they like zoom in on the door and it's like all busted out and it's been like taped over. It's so crazy. Oh, thank you, Ashley. She says happy over 10 K. Thank you. <laughs> Sad I'm late. I'm going to the beginning. I was trying to get the comment. <laughs> It's a good life. It was a good life. Um, so that's a, a significant development. Um, beyond that, looking at the, the scope of the, uh, the situation and the ties this defendant has to my county, um, I uh, would uh, hold our office at the disposal of the Idaho authorities um, to help facilitate a complete uh, background investigation into the defendant, um, both uh, activities prior to the murders occurring within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and his activities after the murders in Pennsylvania. So we stand ready to assist with that effort on an ongoing basis. Thank you. We can now open it up for questions. Can you tell us what state police specifically did or can you give us any indication as to the operations of state police when you were notified? talk about putting tactical uh, in the area. How long were they there? And what's the we're not in a position to give you an exact time. It was at some point prior to when the surveillance was, was taken as the investigation progressed to a point where search warrants could be obtained and the probable cause for those search warrants and an arrest warrant, a fugitive from justice warrant based on the arrest warrant out in Idaho were obtained. We began to, to take the tactical steps to plan to serve them. Were you collecting yeah. evidence prior to his arrest? At this point, like we said, it's it's um, very much pertinent to what's in the affidavits, which we cannot speak about. What's it about his demeanor when the arrest actually happened? Present sense impression, as likewise ongoing investigation, can't discuss. How, uh, Prop 69 News, how is Koberger being transported back to Idaho? Those arrangements are being uh, discussed right now, as well as the logistics. The court order says, those of you who heard it today, it's within the next 10 days, so we're currently working on that in coordination with authorities out in Idaho. Sir? I can't comment. Is he being held in the Monroe County Jail until he's extradited, or is he removed to another? No, place? he's he is lodged in the he since he was dropped off there Friday morning, he's resided in Monroe County Prison. Arlene, are you in here? I know she's from PA. He so the officer is calling it Monroe County Prison. Is it really a prison, or is it the jail? Is what I'm wondering. They, I mean, other than you know. Um, 
Richard Allen and the Delphi case, I they normally don't house, you know, people like tr if they're transporting inmates or someone that's standing trial, they normally will house them in the jail. They normally don't house them in the prison. So Arlene, so is it a is it a real is it a real prison or is it a jail? That they like Monroe County Prison. It says it's is it really a jail though? Like smaller? Because it's just so weird if they put them in a prison, but. I'm like, is Arlene still here? <laughs> yeah, so the, he was in the Latah County Jail when he was over in, now, in, in Idaho. This is when he was over in Monroe, when he first got arrested in Pennsylvania before they shipped his butt back over, over the plane. We watched the whole plane ride. It was like Santa Claus coming. I don't know if you guys remember that. You think it's a prison? Yeah, because he's he keeps referring to it as a prison, so maybe they need to lock him up somewhere. Extra, extra, extra. But, um, because, you know, he's saying in prison, but in my mind, I'm going, is it really a jail? Because, you know, they normally don't house them in a prison, but yeah, yeah, and PA, yeah. So this is the P this is the PA press conference one here that we're watching. We just, I haven't seen it since, like, the first time they aired it. It's been a while. So Correct, yes. I really learned a lot more. At this point, that's still being coordinated between uh, the state police and the authorities out there. We don't know. Will the affidavit confirm the field when he arrived in Idaho? I don't want to speak out of my lane. When I watched the press conference on Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific time, I was alerted to the fact that, in, according to Idaho state law, that the uh, affidavits have to be served in hit to him once he's extradited back before they could be unsealed. Has he been, has anyone else been arrested? Ongoing investigation. Has the motive been determined? I can't comment on that either. I apologize. He's presently back. He was transported from the courthouse by Montgomery County, or excuse me, Monroe County uh, Sheriff. And the, the logistics of who's going to transport him out to Idaho are still being discussed. We don't know. Yeah. Can you confirm the time of his arrest and how much law enforcement presence there actually was? Uh, I would say it was in the early morning hours of Friday, December 30th. Uh, tactical assets on scene were probably in the neighborhood of 50. Were you afraid he was going to get tipped off before you got him? I would say overall about this entire operation and the credit goes, you know, this is a part that the state police played humbly. Uh, you look at uh, Moscow Police Department, 38 sworn, um, 19,000 leads, uh, the video evidence that they had to develop in order to uh, put that out, all public source information. 19,000 leads, he just said. So within six weeks, could you go through, okay, if you had six weeks, could you go through 19,000 pages, let's say, of paperwork? I could. It's a lot. 19. It's a lot. I think it's a lot of, a lot of everything, but you know, um, it's a lot of evidence for them to go through, like the, all those tips to go through. I mean, you know, everybody was calling every Elantra in from here to Timbuktu. Good thing, because that's how they kind of I think caught up with him. Um, but it's just crazy how much they went through in the, def the defense. And I'm not, I'm not trying to bash the defense, but they keep saying like, they want more evidence to look at, but they have all this evidence that they haven't even went through yet. And it's like, you guys better get on the ball. Cause these guys, they went through it. They didn't have very much long. They didn't have very long either. You know, he actually would have to go through those law clerks. Um, I think his actual lawyers are going to have to go through those. I would think they're getting paid the big bucks, but you know, you never know, you know, when you go to the doctor, the nurse helps you more than the doctor sometimes does you go to surgery, have surgery. That's like me. I, you know, I feel like, um, the clerks probably do a lot. Yeah. They want, yeah, they want it. Yeah. <laughs> I know they want, they're like, can we have more time and more evidence at the same time? Sure. But when you talk about the service of a high risk warrant for someone who's committed or alleged to have committed uh, four homicides, there's nothing routine about that. And all of those tactical steps that were taken uh, were in conjunction with the best efforts of the authorities, local, state and federal, both in Idaho and here to ensure that we could do it safely uh, and to ensure that we could uh, get him into custody and that those service of the search warrants could occur. Sir, can we ask you a question of the first assistant? Uh, Mr. Mancuso, you described having read to a degree the contents of that affidavit of probable cause and that you 
possibly speculated or theorized that he wanted to get back to read that as well, because he can't read that. Can you give us an indication, though, of the seriousness of what you did? I know you can't talk about it, but can you share with us something? Yeah, I can't get into the details, sir, but I, I can say it involved the um, defendant's connection to a scene of a crime consisting of four murdered people. So that's the significance of it. Can you confirm that there is a connection between Brian Hilberger and any of the victims? I can't uh, discuss that. How confident are you uh, that he is guilty of these crimes? That wouldn't be my place to say. Uh, certainly confident enough that um, there was ample probable cause for the issuance of the various warrants in the case. What was your reaction when you I have a question. Now I forget my question. It was a good one. Hold on. <laughs> it was a good one. Oh, okay. So if you are an officer, maybe Detective John would know this one. If you're an officer in another state, like um, like in this case, the crimes happened in Idaho, but Kohlberger went to Pennsylvania. So the cops get the PCA. They're able to read it. The DA, I guess he was able to read it. Um, is it their decision if they go pick them up or do they just have to go arrest them? Like, do they, um, if they're like, well, we don't think that this probable cause is sufficient enough. Can they just be like, we're not going to arrest them in our state? Like, is that a thing? I mean, I'm like, I've got questions, you know, cause that's just really weird. Like, I mean, he, cause he read it and he, I, his eyes, his facial expressions is saying all I need to hear. <laughs> But um, I'm just wondering, like, look at that face. He's like, um, but I'm wondering if, like, you know, they say, here's the probable cause. You know, so that means these officers had to have read that probable cause. And they thought that there was enough evidence there as well to go arrest him. So, yeah, for the extradition process. But, yeah, I'm just wondering if they could say no. Like, um, if they got the PCA and they were just like this. Like say that there was like a the the PCA they they got like say this is a different case, and it was junk like there was nothing in there. Could they be like, no, we're not, we're not going to arrest him? I don't know. I'd be throwing myself at the mercy of the, everybody. I'd be like, don't get me, don't get me. And I own like you know, I mean they're they're pretty much saying like we don't want him, take him, take him back. And they did say they were going to extradite him within 10, 10 days. Yes, the judge could say no. Oh, okay. Oh. That'd be kind of crazy, wouldn't it? But um, yeah, they said they were going to extradite him within 10 days. They extradited him within like two or something like that, I think, or three. He was in court by the sixth, fifth or sixth. So they got him out of there quick. And like I said um, earlier, we watched it like Santa Claus was flying into town. Do you guys remember that? Like he was on the helicopter. Then they put like the bucket on his head or like helmet on him um, when they were taking him from the plane to the truck. It was pretty crazy. Maybe we'll have to, we'll have to rewatch that. We've all talked about you followed this. This happened states away. When you get that call, or you all get the call, that this person could be right here in your home area. What's your reaction? Well, I was surprised. Really, Monroe County, of all places, um, it hits close to home. I, it's a normal human reaction, I would think, under the circumstances. Do you know when he and his um, father left Idaho or Washington Grove, Pennsylvania, what that date was? Um, no, I don't know the exact date, ma'am. Ultimately, we understand the middle of December. Is that correct? I think that's approximate. And what about we heard um, reports that they were stopped not once but twice on the highway. Can you elaborate? I'll defer to um, his Pennsylvania public defender on that. Do you have reason to believe that Kohlberger is connected to other crimes and unsolved mysteries in the area? Um, I wouldn't uh, answer that question at this time. If you are looking at crimes that may be unsolved, what do you think That would be a normal thing to do. For the BSB here, said he was taken without incident. Is it safe to say that, uh, I shouldn't say it's safe to say, but did it seem like he was expecting? I wouldn't comment on what his present sense was. I would just comment that the professionalism of the CERT team uh, and their tactical training definitely proved in a situation like this uh, to do it in the in the most tactically sound uh, and fastest way possible. Was there anybody else in the house at the time? Uh, his parents were in the house at the time. Did they say anything to you? Again, present sense impression. I, I can't comment on that ongoing investigation. You went right down the door. Uh, force was used. The, the warrants were issued for evening search warrants, which in Pennsylvania requires uh, additional probable cause in order to serve them at, at uh, the hours of darkness. 
I would defer to the first assistant to talk about the legal burden that you bear in order to obtain those. But from a tactical standpoint, based upon all of the briefings that we had uh, developed and all of the intelligence we had developed, we thought that was the best time to serve it. And what tipped off that um, Pennsylvania was involved with this? Uh, they were alerted by, by the FBI. Troopers in the Bureau of Criminal Investigation were alerted. Anything on like, his social media pages that tipped anything? I can't comment. Is there cooperative in this whole process? Can't have it ongoing, like I said. State police's role here was uh, to serve the warrants and assist with the surveillance, which we've done. Um, we've been part of major investigations. You know, these are men and women who uh, take an oath to protect their communities and the Commonwealth here. We're very humbled with the opportunity that we had, uh, given a case that has really gained international attention, to, to play a small part in it. And our hat is off to uh, Moscow PD again with the the size and the complexity of this investigation and the work that they've done to get us here today. And this is only the beginning of the next step. If it's determined that anyone here in Pennsylvania either help to conceal or dispose of any evidence, then you would be a part of this case or would it go? I would say that we would pledge whatever support we can for ongoing investigations with the Idaho authorities here in Pennsylvania. Absolutely. We would help them in any way we could. Were there any weapons found in the home? I don't want to get into what was actually seized in the, in the house pursuant to the evidentiary nature of it. Into why you all decided to go in overnight to make the arrest? Uh, those are tactical decisions in terms of base surveillance. Uh, I don't want to give out too many uh, tactical uh, factors that go into that situation, but obviously surveillance was conducted and we wanted to go in at a time when we thought it would be the safest for everybody, safest for anybody else in the house, safest for um, Mr. Koberger, and safest for our people. There was an interesting walking. question asked earlier about the uh, the care that needed to be taken to not tip uh, the, the suspect off. Could you describe um, how how long that lid had to be on things and how many people were, were um, involved in it? Like how many people knew and for how long? So I would say, I would answer the question this way. I, I don't want to get into a timeline in terms of when we were notified by the FBI and when the surveillance began. Obviously, we know on Thursday night into Friday morning is when the, uh, the warrants were served. Uh, I would say as a credit to the professionals, both standing behind me and others not here, many others not here, uh, the information was held very close. Uh, and we did not want to have any situation where uh, Mr. Koberger potentially would be tipped off. So as a result of that, I would say a close number of approximately seven to eight uh, individuals, maybe 10 on the most within the PSP side of this operation knew about it. Days, can we say? Or? I would say for a period of time. I would I would not feel comfortable commenting any more than that for a period of time. And then, as the tactical assets were were brought in, people were briefed. When the movement plan is finally decided, will there be an announcement? Will uh, uh, not from the state police. So we're, we would defer to uh, Moscow and the uh, the authorities in Idaho. Starts leaving Pennsylvania. Well, we have security concerns now, obviously, to move. Any prisoner, anytime you move somebody from a secure prison to another place, uh, we don't want, there won't be an announcement from the state police in terms of those logistics, but they're being worked on right now. Can you confirm? Can you guess when you think he might be moved roughly you know, tomorrow? We would like to do it as soon as possible, but the court order says 10 days. We have 10 days to coordinate it. Can you say, like, he's on a plane tonight? Is it possible he could be on a plane tonight? That's a possibility, right? I can't, I would think that's, a, that's probably not likely. Uh, we're looking into that right now. Can you confirm or deny that a window was broken in order to gain access into the home? Uh, there were multiple windows that were broken, I believe, to, to gain access as well as multiple doors. I think the uh, video of the, the house after the fact confirms that. And that would all be part of the tactical plan based on the floor plan of the house, et cetera, and what the uh, CERT operators would do to serve those warrants. Was the suspect on your radar before, and are you looking at any connections? I wouldn't comment on that based on the ongoing nature. How about his, did he have a criminal past? According to the UJS, I didn't see anything. I can't comment on a, on, a, on a person's criminal history during an ongoing investigation. Right. Uh, Mr. Mancuso said that uh, you stand ready to assist in giving the complete background to the defendant. What specifically is law enforcement interested in? That'll be the last question after Mr. Mancuso. Um, in any uh, case of this nature, um, and I prosecuted a fair share of, of homicides, double homicides, that sort of thing, um, you, you want to look at any evidence of possible motive. You want to look at any evidence of a, of a pattern, 
uh, of modus operandi or method. Um, you want to get um, into the um, subject's uh, character, mental state to the best you can, um, that sort of thing. So it'll be an all-encompassing effort, uh, which we stand ready for. Okay. We have our ways. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. He said we have our ways. <laughs> that made me kind of chuckle a little bit. That made me laugh. Uh, I really enjoyed that officer. Um, I mean, that that DA. I uh, No offense to Thompson. I love Santa. I think he's adorable. But I liked that guy's presence. You know what I mean? Like, he was, like, commanding. Like, he set the this, this stage. Um, he set the tone. Like, everyone was listening, you know? We have our ways. I love it. Mindy said, I know. <laughs> what a great answer. We have our ways. Look at all the Brian Koberger stuff in the background. That's a lot. Sorry. I was like, I was eating pizza when we were, when the video was playing. Um, Steve said, I had family in the FBI. They didn't talk about their cases until they left the FBI. Yeah. Yeah. He was professional. And I could just like the Pennsylvania cops, I can just see them being kind of, uh, a different breed than the Moscow police, you know, just because people in Pennsylvania, we do have mouse on us. I'm from there. I'm from there. We have our very outspoken peoples out there. I feel like the East coast in general is outspoken people. <laughs> as much as I'm one with so many channels, I've never seen her being arrested. Is there any with who being arrested with him being arrested with Brian? Cause Brian, we don't have any with him being arrested, but, yeah, I had some pizza. I know. I was like, I was hungry and I'm not very, no, I'm not very hungry. Um, I eat like a bird. I pick like a bird. You would think I would have no meat on me. Oh, nice. Wizard, you're moving. That's always exciting. I hope it's exciting anyway. Cause some, you know, sometimes it can be stressful, but it's exciting at the same time. They're going to read you our place um, where we're living. Finally, we've lived here long enough to where they're going to read you our whole apartment. <laughs> It's bad. Um, that's really bad, isn't it? We've lived here that long. Like every year they will um, give you something like they'll redo your countertops or whatever, like something like that. And we've never um, chimed in what we've wanted over six years. We've never like cashed in on that. And um, the apartment, our apartment's great. It's just a little outdated. I feel like it needs a, like a, a pick me up, you know? So it's like, it's really nice. Or a bedroom house. Oh, that's a lot of moving then. <laughs> he's one of the dumbest serial killers ever. Yeah, he's, um, he didn't even get the chance to be serial. You know, he could only be mass murder. Well, unless, you know, where there's victims we don't know about. Your place was renovated before you moved in. Oh, I bet that's nice, Cheryl. I bet that's nice. We, um, it was, I mean, it was, be it's a beautiful place. It's beautiful. But for the money that you spend to live here, you should own two houses. So you should at least own one great apartment, you know, no problems. We put the floors in ourselves. Um, we took the initiative to do that, but there's just some like cosmetic stuff from like the tornado, the tornado we had that, that needs fixed that they still haven't fixed. It's been three years. <laughs> so, um, rent prices are ridiculous. I don't even know how people can afford to live. I don't know how people do it. I don't know how y'all do it. I don't know how y'all do it. Like it's crazy. Um, the price of things. But I did notice before I jump off here, I don't know if your guys' hospitals are like this, but I walked to my hospital the other day to get Botox and I didn't have to wear a mask. There was like, I went up to, um, I was just there like four months ago and I had to wear a mask. I like went to grab the mask from the dispenser and I went to go put it on and I'm looking inside. And I'm like, nobody's wearing a mask. And I'm like, are we cool? Cause you know, like Ohio, they, I mean, this is Ohio State University too. Like this is, I was really surprised, which I mean, it's great. I mean, if we're open, we're open, but I, I, Ashley Higgins in our chat had COVID, you know? And I'm like, people around here still wear them summer. I think that they, I don't know. I don't know why people wear them. Like, do you have COVID? Like, or are you just wearing it because you want to hide your face? Because I mean, it was, it started to get nice there for a while. I'm not going to lie. The winter time, it was fine. I was cool with it. Um, working sucks though. Like, and working with the public and having to wear a mask. No, it's terrible. It's terrible. I did it for a year and it was terrible. 
or however long we had to wear those GMS masks for six months, a year, it was forever. Oh, I'm sorry, Brooklyn. I know how it is. It's just really bad out there right now. It's just crazy bad. And then like, I, don't, the, I mean, our rent has, our rents went up, I think like $600 since we moved here, 400 or something. I'm like, this isn't even right. <laughs> can you, like, can you do that? Can you, can you really do that and go to bed at night? They can. I mean, they own 50 apartment complexes. <laughs> Oh my gosh, really? Your, your daughter's friend's brother died of COVID at 24. That's too young. You got it twice? The heck? How did... How did... Oh man, I didn't get it at all. I got I got lucky. Um, It's probably because I don't know anybody to go around. I mean, to really tell you the truth, I'm always quarantined. Um, Me, Vincent, the dogs, and the cat. Like, that's who I'm around all the time. Other than you guys. You know... Um, so I think that's why I was so quarantined. And plus like, and then it was like my, I had a best friend at the time, Jennifer, um, she worked at another store. So me and she's like over like cleanliness is, you know, next to godliness. And so she's super, I knew she was like, wouldn't have, you know, ever get COVID. I just knew she wouldn't ever even like be around it to get it because she, she's quarantined with her husband most of the time too. So it was fine to meet up with her, but Oh, COVID made your lupus so much worse. I wonder if that's what happened with my body. Like, I didn't get COVID, but my nerves are just like on something crazy now. Six ninety five over two grand. Oh my gosh, Mindy, that's. We started at nine hundred, and I think it's like fourteen hundred, or something. Um, it hurts. Cheryl, you were homeless then? Oh, wow. I remember you saying you were homeless before in a shelter in a motel. I never caught it. You're so lucky, Cheryl. See, isn't that crazy? That, like, okay, uh, I'm going to use you as an example. Like, Cheryl, like, you know, um, she was around like these, all these people that a lot of them probably couldn't afford um, the proper, you know, hand sanitizer, masks, things of that nature. Um, and then you have like Vincent's dad. He didn't, I don't know, he, his dad died during COVID. But we don't think he got COVID. We just think that like him not being out, like did it. But you know what I mean? I could see that like the diff like the differences is like your body was just like built. <laughs> it was built for it. You know what I mean? And COVID came in Cheryl's body was like, I was born for this shit. Don't even try me, you know? And then poor uh, Vincent's dad, his immune system just didn't, it couldn't take it. And that was really sad. Cause I think I never got to meet him. Where was I, where I live in Washington, you can't rent. What was that? You can't rent. Oh my gosh. In the, anywhere in the city, less than 1400, even studio apartments. Oh my Lord. I've seen this. Have you watched these little tiny apartment, apartment things on like YouTube, like New York city, they'll have like the little time and they're like this apartment, you can touch like all the walls. And it's like, this cost me 3,500 a month. I'm like van life, but in a high rise. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I always thought, um, I always thought that I could do van life. I want to do van life, but I don't, I don't know. We have like, we do need our space around here, but I, I think that I, we would be good in a van. The Cheryl. Now that is the stuff that pisses me off. Her rent is 1089 and she gets 800 a month. That's like my mother. My mother was like that. My mother got an, an, a set amount of money every month. It was not a lot. It's 1400, I think 1200. <coughs> um, and she had to pay her rent and then, um, her spend down for her counseling and her, her medics, her medication. And it's sad. I have to say though, I have really good insurance. Knock on wood. The only bad part about my insurance is like, um, the dental part doesn't cover very good dental. And that's like really it. But I, I pay zero for my prescriptions. I pay zero for my surgeries. I pay zero to see the doctor. Um, I am incredibly fortunate. Even when I was working. So if anyone wants to be like, oh, how, yeah, how's that work if you work on YouTube? When I was working in a, a boutique, I made five times the amount of money I make now. And I was good to go. I was, they still let me um, have my Medicaid. I'm on Medicaid. I think that they have me on, they're just like, leave her on it. She's going to need it. 
for the rest of her life. Like they don't even argue with me about it at all. It's crazy. <laughs> oh, lucky Cadillac plan. No, I really do. I have a really good plan. It's just the state picked it up after my car accident. And I just got really lucky. Like I, I don't get disability or anything like that, but I do get my medical covered. And I'm like, I won't mess with you guys. If you, uh, if you know, you don't take my medical, <laughs> I won't mess with you. But, the, and then the one other thing that sucks about it is like, it's Ohio. So if I were to leave the state for a month, over a month, I wouldn't be able to get my prescriptions covered. And one prescription alone is like $4,000. Like, I don't know how people can pay for that. I feel so bad. Oh, thanks. Be happy for the super sticker. Look at that. Oh, that's cute. Thank you. Be happy. I want a dog like you have on your picture. Wonder what kind of dog those are. I want one like that. I know seniors. Begin oh, the, oh, and the home. Oh no, not the senior citizens. And the oh no, I did you guys ever see them? I, we have a nursing home down the road and there was two, there was a man and a wife and the man was outside of the window and he had his like hand pressed against the window and he was visiting with his wife. Oh, it gives me cold chills just thinking about it. I can't, I couldn't, I can't look at that kind of stuff. Can you imagine? I couldn't, I couldn't imagine being, um, I mean, Vincent's mom during the pandemic, you know, losing her husband. I couldn't imagine. No, we don't have all oh, 1400 for two bedroom. We won't got four bedrooms over here. <laughs> Miserable. We only, we only got two of those. We, you got four. We got two. No, that's what we're going to, we're going to look. Um, we've been looking for a house where we live is so nice. It's so nice. I think it's the nicest town I've ever been in. It's so clean. I look for dirt on the road. Like, you know, the side of the roads always collect, you know, trash and debris and dirt or cigarette butts or whatever. Our roads have zero of that. It's like almost like at Disneyland at the end of the night, they go around and they make sure that none of the buildings at Disneyland have any graffiti or gum or markings on them. It's like people do that in our town. Like there's like little elves or something that come on, clean the whole town up by the next day. Cause you literally, there's not a, any trash around here. And like the people are really nice and the cars are nice and the houses are nice. Like they're not like big giant homes or anything. They're just friendly and nice. It's just really nice. So I just love it. 1500 for your one bedroom, but no washer or dryer. Oh gosh, girl. We should just build a house. We can all live in it because we are all getting ripped off. Yes. <laughs> Andy Libby, I can. I'll take them off of there. I was getting ready to jump off anyway. That's so funny. Last night, someone was like, I've got to go. <laughs> PK's in the background. It made me laugh. But I am going to jump off of here. Um, tomorrow, I wanted to go back to Long Island and kind of go... Um, and see what's going on with that because we did the press conference last week that came out. What was that? Thursday, Friday, Friday, they did a press conference. It was like impromptu press conference. We didn't know that it was happening. So I jumped on and we did a live. Um, it was only like 30 minutes. If you guys want to check it out, but they did announce that they found, um, Jane Doe's name and, um, Oh my gosh, I can't think of it. It's Vergata. The last name's Vergata. Um, why can't I think of, oh my gosh, it's so sad. Too many names, huh? Thought I had it wrote down. I did. I just don't know where I wrote it down. Maybe one of you guys will remember in the chat, but her last name was Vergata, but she got her name back and now I didn't, she just got her name back and I can't remember it. Um, I wrote down too many names. Look at all these notes. There it is. Karen. Karen. Oh, thanks, Isabel. <laughs> as soon as I, I, I saw it. Thank you. I wonder why I couldn't remember the name Karen. Jeez. Karen, that's her name. Shame on me. But no, um, she got her name back. And after 27 years, that's crazy. Crazy. 27 years. I love that for her, you know, like her family. Um, but I think that they're going to end up, they're going to end up um, finding a lot more like connecting him to a lot more victims. And it was good to see you too, John. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome in and welcome back anytime. Um, Lisa said one of the perks of living in California. What was it? I have to get back up so I can read it. Mm -hmm. 
I'll pay 22 a month, not including utilities. Yeah. I know 500 square feet. Me and Vincent's apartment was 500 square feet, our first apartment. And I kind of miss it. This one's like 1200, I think. Oh, we'll go below. Income rent was 1400. 2000 for a studio. That's crazy, guys. We're going to, we're just going to live together. My dad used to build houses. This is so much cheaper to build. That's what we'll do. We'll just build and keep building on as we get more subscribers. Well, thank you guys for joining me tonight. I will see you guys all on the next live. Have a good evening. And I'm going to check into some of those cases we we're talking about tonight, too, some of those um, newer cases. So I'll see you guys all on the next live. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.